Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic uh, at the 11th Investment Treaty Arbitration Conference. Due to uh, the ongoing health uh, uh, concerns, we have decided to keep uh, our conference online for the second year uh, in a row. Believe me that we do miss the opportunity to meet you all in person. Nevertheless, at least one positive thing uh, about having the conference online is that we can host a much wider audience than before, uh, which makes us very happy. Before we get to the program, I would like uh, uh, to say a few words about the experience of the Czech Republic uh, during the past year. With regard to investment arbitration cases, the Czech Republic has successfully defended two investment claims amounting to over $3 million. In one of the cases, we were uh, able to win already in a jurisdictional stage and uh, were awarded most uh, of the legal and administrative costs. There were import uh, important victories, but we still currently have five pending investment arbitrations. As for treaties, the Czech Republic has finished the ratification process of the termination treaty, which will enter into force uh, for us as of 10th December this year, and will result in an immediate termination of 10 EU BITs. Since the last year, we have also had another smoothly running virtual hearing. We believe that the arbitration community has proven to be well prepared for this new challenge. It will be certainly interesting to see how this experience will translate into the future practice uh, of international arbitration. It's something we can discuss perhaps next year. Last but uh, not least, I would like to thank you all uh, for participating in our conference, both the speakers and the participants. Your interest in this annual event is what makes all this possible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you will enjoy our conference. Good afternoon from Prague as well. My name is Jaroslav Kudrna and I'm the head of international arbitration at the Ministry of Finance. I would like to quickly introduce the program of this year's conference. This fall, we have finally received some answers to the questions arising from the groundbreaking Akmer judgment. For example, many wondered about the intra-EU application of the ECT and the CGEU has finally decided this issue in the Comstroy decision in early September. It then issued another decision on the intra-EU application of arbitration clauses in the PL Holdings case in late October. So it comes as no surprise that our first panel, moderated by Krina Baltak, will look into these new developments and their impact. Afterwards, our second panel, moderated by Mallory Silverman, will consider another challenge that investment arbitration is facing today, the application of investment law in disputes involving the environment. But before we get to these issues, we will have the great honor of listening to Professor Christoph Schroyer, who will deliver the keynote lecture entitled The Investments Unity. I would like to mention that I met Professor Schroyer for the first time 10 years ago as a student at the Arbitration Academy in Paris, where he gave a course on the development of investment arbitration. As a fresh law graduate who had not really heard much about investment arbitration at school, I still recall that I found his lecture fascinating and it piqued my interest in this field. And here I am today. Beyond these individual stories, Professor Schroer has undoubtedly immensely contributed to the whole field. And it is a true honor for us to have him here today. So without further ado, I give the floor to Professor Schroer. Thank you very much. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in Prague, although I'd much rather be there in person than via the internet, I must say. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to take you back to first principles, to the concept of an investment, but do not despair. This is not going to be yet another discussion of the Salini test. I will address a different issue that arises from the composite nature of most investments.
Now, an investment is often a complex operation. It may consist of preparatory studies, licenses, government permits, financing agreements, real estate transactions, various contractual arrangements, and a variety of other legal dispositions. Each of these elements has its own legal existence, but in economic terms, they are united to serve a common purpose. Investment tribunals have often treated the various assets and activities that make up an investment as a unity. In most cases, they have not dissected investments into their individual legal components, but have treated them as an integral whole. This holistic approach towards investment has shown itself in several contexts. First, the unity of the investment may determine the very existence of an investment. In some cases, respondents have argued that each of the claimant's assets on its own did not amount to an investment. Claimants argued that these assets looked at in combination did constitute an investment. The simplest example for this constellation is the existence of several interrelated contracts. In Mytilinios versus Serbia and Montenegro, the claimants had entered into a series of agreements. The respondent argued that there was no investment since these were ordinary commercial contracts. The tribunal found that in combination, the contracts amounted to an investment. It said, and I quote, even if one doubted whether the agreements looked at in isolation would constitute investments by themselves, it seems clear that the combined effect of these agreements amounts to an investment, end of quote. Other tribunals too found that several contracts had to be viewed in combination to establish the existence of an investment. Some cases involved a variety of assets and activities that combined to form an investment. For instance, Saipem versus Bangladesh involved the construction of a pipeline governed by a contract, retention money, warranty bonds, as well as an ICC arbitration award in claimant's favor that had been nullified by the respondent's Supreme Court. The tribunal looked at the entire operation to establish the existence of an investment. And I, I quote, the tribunal wishes to emphasize that for the purpose of determining whether there is an investment under Article 25 of the Exit Convention, it will consider the entire operation. In the present case, the entire or overall operation includes the contract, the construction itself, the retention money, the warranty, and the related ICC arbitration. End of quote. Other tribunals have found similarly that all the elements of the claimant's operation must be considered for the purpose of determining whether there was an investment under Article 25 of the Exit Convention. But the principle of the unity of the investment was not always applied consistently. <coughs> Mitchell versus Congo concerned the seizure by the Congolese authorities of a legal consulting firm and the incarceration of its employees. The tribunal noted the movable assets, know-how, goodwill, money, as well as services, which in their totality amounted to an investment. In proceedings for the awards annulment, the ad hoc committee also paid lip service to the concept of the unity of the investment but then it proceeded to zoom in on one aspect of the investment, the services provided by the law firm. In the view of the ad hoc committee, these services did not contribute to the host state's economic development. This and the award's failure to state coherent reasons led the committee <coughs> to annul the award. In another group of cases, the existence of an investment as such was not in doubt. The question was whether certain aspects that were incidental 
to the core assets and activities of the investment partook of its status and protection. A typical example for an activity ancillary to the investment are financing arrangements. In Holiday Inns versus Morocco, the agreement for the establishment and operation of hotels had also provided for financing by the government. This was done by means of separate loan contracts. The loan contracts contained choice of forum clauses in favor of the Moroccan courts. This led the respondent to object to the jurisdiction of exit over the claims connected with the loan contracts. The tribunal emphasized the general unity of an investment operation and asserted its jurisdiction also over the loan contracts. <coughs> Other tribunals too have accepted that loan agreements were part of the overall investments they were designed to serve. Now, paradoxically, the outlier in this line of cases is CSOB versus Slovakia, which is commonly celebrated as the paradigmatic authority for the unity of investments. The claimant had granted a loan to a Slovak collection company that was secured by a guarantee of the Slovak Ministry of Finance. Slovakia argued that the claims against it did not arise directly out of the loan and were therefore outside the tribunal's jurisdiction. The tribunal found that the loan to the collection company was closely related to and could not be disassociated from the other transactions and that the Slovak Republic's undertaking and the loan formed an integrated whole. It adopted the doctrine of the unity of the investment operation and said in an often quoted passage that you're probably familiar with, and I quote, an investment is frequently a rather complex operation composed of various interrelated transactions, each element of which standing alone might not in all cases qualify as an investment. Hence, a dispute that is brought before the center must be deemed to arise directly out of an investment, even when it is based on a transaction which standing alone would not qualify as an investment under the convention, provided that the particular transaction forms an integral part of an overall operation that qualifies as an investment." End of quote. But then a few months later, the tribunal issued another decision on jurisdiction. In that decision, the tribunal found that it did not have jurisdiction with respect to the loan agreements. The unity of the investment operation did not mean that the tribunal automatically acquired jurisdiction over each agreement concluded to implement the investment operation. But in many other cases, tribunal, tribunals have embraced the doctrine of the unity of the investment also with respect to related activities incidental to the investment. Let me give you a few examples. A claim for reimbursement of architect's fees was found to be part of an investment involving the construction of housing units. A share transfer agreement entered into in the context of the privatization of a gas transportation company was part of the investment. An option to buy incidental to a management and operation contract was part of the investment. A lease contract in connection with the construction of an oil container terminal was part of the investment. A gas purchase and sale agreement ancillary to the development and operation of a gas field was part of the overall investment. Tribunals have applied the concept of the unity of an investment also to determine the temporal limits of an investment before and after the core activity. The time of the inception of an investment is important, especially in cases where preparatory steps never matured into the investment's intended activity. Since the exit convention and the treaties providing for consent to arbitration 
require the existence of an investment, the exact starting point of the investment can be decisive for jurisdiction. Investment tribunals have decided that mere negotiations that are ultimately unsuccessful and do not lead to a contract or to any actual investment activity do not amount to an investment. An investment does, however, exist if an agreement materializes, even if it does not ultimately lead to actual economic activity. The decisive criterion for the existence of such an agreement is that it contains binding commitments and has financial value. An investment also exists if the relevant activity has actually commenced in the form of economically significant steps pending the conclusion of a final legal instrument. Tribunals used the unity of the investment doctrine to underpin the inclusion of pre-investment activities in their concept of investment. For instance, in Bear Creek Mining versus Peru, the claimant had obtained an authorization to acquire and possess concessions and mining rights, as well as seven mining concessions. After protests by local communities, these rights were revoked. In the ensuing arbitration, respondent argued that claimant's rights and activities had never matured into an investment since the necessary permits were still missing. Claimant pointed to its various steps and activities and invoked the unity of the investment. The tribunal followed claimant's approach and said, and I quote, it is uncontroversial that an investment typically consists of several interrelated economic activities, which step by step finally lead to the implementation of a project such as mining activity, end of quote. It followed that there had been an investment for purposes of the FTA between Canada and Peru. In a similar manner, tribunals have employed the concept of the unity of the investment to include activities that took place after the termination of the investment proper. <clears throat> In Chevron and Texaco versus Ecuador, Texpet, a subsidiary of Texaco, had operated under an oil concession agreement of 1973 until 1992. After performing environmental remediation work in 1995, Texpet and the respondent entered into a settlement agreement discharging Texpet from further environmental obligations. Private litigants, however, pursued class actions for environmental damage. The claimants initiated arbitration proceedings against Ecuador on the ground that it was improperly seeking to shift its environmental obligations on the claimants after having released them through the settlement agreement. The respondent contested the ju tribunal's jurisdiction, arguing that the investment had terminated with the expiry of the concession agreement. In respondent's view, the settlement agreement was a standalone agreement that did not qualify as an investment. The claimants argued that its obligations under the settlement agreement were components of a larger integrated investment. The tribunal followed the claimant's position and said, and I quote again, in the tribunal's view, the investment did not terminate in 1992 because there is a close and inextricable link between Texpet's 1973 concession agreement and the 1995 settlement agreement. It is necessary to treat the 1995 settlement agreement as a continuation of the earlier concession agreement so that it forms part of the overall investment invoked by Texpet. The doctrine of the unity of the investment also has a territorial dimension. 
many treaties providing for investment arbitration refer to investments in the host state's territory. Some types of investment, however, are difficult to pin to a particular territory. The issue of a territorial nexus has arisen in connection with financial transactions, such as loans, bonds, deposit receipts, or payments. Other cases concerned pre-shipment inspections. Tribunal practice indicates that the performance of the relevant activity need not take place in the territory of the host state, at least not in its entirety. Neither is a physical transfer of assets into the host state's territory necessary. What matters is that the economic effect of the investment is felt in the host state's territory. In some cases, tribunals relied on the doctrine of the unity of the investment to substantiate the nexus between the investment and the host state's territory. In Ambiente Uficio versus Argentina, the respondent had argued that the investment in government bonds had not taken place on Argentinian soil. The tribunal pointed out that Argentina was the beneficiary of the investment and that it had to conceive of the investment in question as a unified economic operation. <coughs> a series of cases concerned pre-shipment inspections of cargoes destined for the respondent states. These inspections take place in the ports of origin and hence outside the territory of the country of, for whose benefits they are undertaken. The respondents argued in these cases that the services were performed principally outside their territory. The claimants pointed out <coughs> that some activities had taken place in the territory of the, in, of the respondents and that even the activities outside the territories were to their benefit. <coughs> in SGS versus Philippines, the tribunal followed the claimant's arguments and in doing so relied inter alia on the unity of the investment. It said, and I quote, a substantial and non-severable part of the overall service was provided in the Philippines. In SGS versus Paraguay, another case dealing with pre-shipment inspections, the tribunal was even clearer in its deployment of the doctrine of the unity of the investment. It said, and I quote, this tribunal does not consider it consistent with the facts presented to subdivide claimants activities into services provided abroad and services provided in Paraguay. The services provided by SGS in Paraguay were not severable or ancillary. They were part and parcel of the services for which SGS expected to be paid." End of quote. <clears throat> now, a few words about the unity of an investment and its legality. Treaties providing for the protection of investments often require that the investments must have been made in accordance with host state law. An investment made in violation of the law will not enjoy the treaty's protection and will hence not be under the jurisdiction of a tribunal. Tribunals have found that even in the absence of a treaty clause to this effect, investments that are contrary to host state law will not enjoy protection. In some cases, tribunals have used the concept of the unity of the investment to extend the consequences of an illegality to the entire investment. An illegality that tainted one aspect of the investment's formation had the consequence of withdrawing protection from the entire investment. This included the negation of jurisdiction over the dispute. In Fraport versus the Philippines, the investment had involved secret shareholder agreements 
that were contrary to Philippine law. The tribunal found, therefore, the dispute was not within its jurisdiction. In proceedings for the awards annulment, Fraport argued that the secret shareholder agreements were only part of its investment and that the tribunal should not have declined jurisdiction. The ad hoc committee in annulment proceedings did not accept the suggestion that the tribunal should have examined the legality of the investment's several components separately. It said, and I quote, the committee is of the view that the tribunal was entitled to treat Fraport's investment as a unity pursuing the same objective. The tribunal, by applying its analysis to the investment of Fraport as a whole, has not manifestly exceeded its powers. End of quote. <clears throat> now, so far, so good. What I have described so far gives a reasonably coherent picture of the unity of the investment for purposes of jurisdiction. Now, unfortunately, the situation is less clear when one reaches the merits of a case. Although tribunals have applied the unity doctrine also to the merits, practice is not homogeneous. This point is best illustrated by looking at cases dealing with expropriation. It is widely accepted that to amount to an expropriation, a deprivation must be substantial. It must affect the investment in whole or in significant part. This means that the expropriating measure must have led to the destruction of the investment's capacity to be economically viable. The requirement that a deprivation must be total or near total to amount to an expropriation would support the concept of the unity of the investment. Whether an expropriation has occurred can only be determined by examining the fate of the investment as a whole and not by looking separately at its component parts. This would exclude the notion of a particular of a sorry, this would exclude the notion of a partial expropriation of the investment. Practice is, however, divided on this point. Some tribunals have indeed established the existence of an expropriation by looking at what happened to the investment as a whole. In doing so, they sometimes relied on the investment's unity. In Telenor versus Hungary, uh, regulatory interference had affected the investor's telecommunication services. The claimant in support of its expropriation claim pointed to several elements of its investment. The tribunal accepted that these elements together constitute the investment. It found that the conduct complained of must be such as to have a major adverse impact on the economic value of the investment. In order to establish that impact, the invest investment had to be looked at as a whole, and I quote, the tribunal considers that in the present case, at least the investment must be viewed as a whole and that the test the tribunal has to apply is whether viewed as a whole, the investment has suffered substantial erosion or value. The Telenor tribunal rejected the expropriation claim because the effect of the measures of which the claimant had complained fell short of a substantial economic deprivation of its investment. Other in tribunals too have examined the impact of expropriatory measures on the investment as a whole and not upon its component parts. On the other hand, some tribunals have recognized the possibility of partial expropriations. They have looked at individual elements of investments to determine whether they had been expropriated. 
In Middle East cement was Egypt, the investment consisted into alia of a free zone license, a ship, and a letter of guarantee. The tribunal treated these as discrete investments and examined separately whether they had been expropriated. It found that Egypt had indeed expropriated the license and the ship. On the other hand, it found that there had not been an expropriation of the letter of guarantee. Other tribunals too have envisaged the possibility of a partial expropriation. The unity of an investment may well be relevant also to other standards of protection. The application of the fair and equitable treatment standard may depend on whether a measure has affected the entire investment or only parts of it. Especially for the tests of reasonableness and proportionality, it may be relevant whether the state's measures affected only certain aspects of the investment or its entirety. On the other hand, unfair or inequitable treatment by the host state leading to compensable damage may well affect only certain elements of the investment. Similar considerations apply to other standards of protection, such as full protection and security, non-discrimination, and the prohibition of arbitrary or discriminatory treatment. The violation of an umbrella clause may affect a contract that is part of the investment. It is not realistic to require that these violations always extend to the entire investment, although violations affecting parts of the investment are likely to have an overall economic effect on the entire investment. Let me conclude. The concept of the unity of the investment is widely used by tribunals when examining their jurisdiction. It gives precedence to economic realism over legal formalism. It accords with the object and purpose of treaties for the protection of investment by looking at integrated economic operations rather than individual legal transactions. The unity principle helps to coordinate investment disputes by concentrating jurisdiction in the hands of tribunals. It avoids claim splitting and parallel proceedings. At the same time, the significance of the unity principle should not be overestimated. Although widely used, it has not been applied uniformly. Very few tribunals have rejected it outright but some have embraced it in principle only to abandon it when it came to its concrete application. At the merit stage, the situation is more complex. Practice on the possibility of partial expropriation is divided. Also with respect to the violation of other standards of protection, tribunals may discard the unity of the investment and look at segments of the investment seriatim. The principle of unity should not be overstretched. It cannot serve as a definitional element for the concept of an investment. Although many investments combine various assets and activities to a common economic purpose, some investments are unidimensional and consist of a single transaction. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for um, letting us take a peek to your into your current research and also uh, especially for uh, starting off today's conference. Um, According to our current schedule, uh, we are planning on having a coffee break, a uh, 10 minute coffee break. Um, I think we should do one. Maybe we can, since we are like three minutes earlier, we can finish uh, now and, and start again at 4.47, if maybe the next panel would be prepared, Krina.
Wonderful then. Thank you. Okay, so we will meet here again in 10 minutes at 4.47. Thank you.
Okay, so it's 4.47 and that means that we can start with our first uh, panel. Uh, please let me introduce you uh, to uh, Dr. Krina, uh, who will be chair of the next panel. Uh, Krina is uh, associate professor in international arbitration at the Stockholm University, but uh, this short description definitely doesn't give her enough credit. So I encourage all of you to take a peek into our uh, speaker bio that we've uh, distributed uh, and, and, and look at all our presenters. Um, also, there's one thing, uh, both panels uh, will have the option of, of questions from the audience. So everyone, please feel free and we highly encourage you to file uh, uh, questions in our chat. It should be uh, available to everyone. Um, but that's it from me. Uh, I see Krina is already here with me. Wonderful. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome all to the first panel of the 11 Investment Treaty Arbitration Conference. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers, to the Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic for the wonderful organization and the kind invitation. I can only say that Prague is very cold in Stockholm today, so I'm sorry for not joining you in Prague uh, from minus 10 degrees here today. Uh, but I think this is the appropriate setting for um, tackling in one hour a very complex topic, which is the uncertain future of the intra -E investment protection. And for this, of course, I need uh, help. And I have a stellar uh, experienced panel with me today. Veronica Corom is a partner with Keritius based in Paris and assistant professor at ESSEC Business School in Paris. Kabir Dugal is a senior advisor with Arnold and Porter based in New York and adjunct professor at Columbia Law School. Simon Battiford is a partner with Curtis Mallet Prevost based in Brussels and New York. And Tom Sikora is senior counsel with ExxonMobil based in Houston and the chair of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. Our panel today is going to be dynamic. Uh, we'll proceed on the basis of questions that I'll ask to our distinguished panelists. Uh, and I would, uh, as you could hear, we like to encourage our audience to ask questions, to put their comments in the chat. Uh, this will be made available directly to me. Uh, I will make sure that we reserve uh, enough minutes at the end of the panel to discuss and answer these questions. For a very long time, the argument of the EU institutions, including the Commission, was that far from being incompatible with EU law, BITs were instruments necessary to prepare for the accession to the Union of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. The association agreements between the Union and candidate countries also contain provisions for the conclusion of BITs between member states and candidate countries. The Commission attempted to explain that changing this in its position on the incompatibility of BITs with the EU and FEU treaties, maintaining that the agreements in questions were necessary in order to prepare for the accession of the candidate countries. However, if those BITs were justified only during the association period, and each party was aware that they would become incompatible with the EU and FEU treaties, as soon as the first state concerned had become a member of the Union, why did the accession treaty not provide for the termination of, of those agreements, thus leaving them in uncertainty, which has lasted more than 30 years in the case of some member states and 13 years in the case of many others. Furthermore, all the member states and the Union have ratified the Energy Charter Treaty, that multilateral treaty operates even between member states, since it was concluded not as an agreement between the Union and its member states of the one part and third countries of the other part, but as an ordinary multilateral treaty in which all the contracting parties participate on an equal footing. 
In that sense, the material provisions for the protection of investments provided for in that treaty and the ISDS mechanism also operate between member states. I note that if no EU institution and no member state sought an opinion from the court on the compatibility of that treaty with the EU and FEU treaties, this is because none of them had the slightest suspicion that it might be incompatible. I would add that the systemic risk, which according to the Commission, intra-UBITs represent to the uniformity and effectiveness of EU law is greatly exaggerated. UNCTAD statistics show that out of 62 intra-arbitral proceedings, which over a period of decades have been closed, the, in the, the investors have been successful in only 10 cases, representing 16.1% of those 62 cases, a rate significantly below the 26.9% of the victories for investors at the global level. The arbitral tribunals have to a large extent allowed the Commission to intervene in arbitrations, and to my knowledge, in none of those 10 cases was the arbitral tribunal required to review the validity of acts of the Union or the compatibility of acts of the member states with the EU law. The Mikula case example is, in my view, not relevant in the present case. The fact that there is only one single example reinforces my opinion that the fear expressed by certain member states and the commission of a systemic risk created by intra-UBITs is greatly exaggerated. These are not my words. Um, these are the words of the Advocate General Watelet in the Slovak Republic versus Zakmea on 19th of September 2017. And this was the beginning of the end. So this is the panel today, and I will start with uh, Kabir. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, this um, short paragraph uh, from the long opinion of the Advocate General Watelet is not sufficient to uh, introduce the evolution of the intra-UBIT uh, or EU investment protection, which is necessary for our panel today. So if we look back to pre-Lisbon Treaty and post-Lisbon Treaty, where do we stand, Kabir? Thank you, Krina. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm feeling cold hearing the minus 10 degrees that you mentioned, uh, but I think it's safe to say for all of us, we would rather be in Prague. This is, I think, one of the most spectacular events. It generally takes place in a palace and not many conferences take place in palaces. Uh, but as Martina mentioned, you know, the fact that we're doing this virtually does allow for greater access, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Krina, you've asked me a bajillion dollar question. What is going on in Europe when it comes to investment arbitration? And the answer is a lot, a lot, and it makes the mind spin. So I'm going to try and tease out a variety of different issues. Krina has given us very strict time and she has told us she's going to enforce it strictly. So bear with me if I'm insulting your intelligence, but our panelists are going to tease out some of these in further detail. Uh, let's just look at what the legal framework is when it comes to European institutions, and I'm simplifying things here again just for ease. Let's look at the main treaties and what role did they have when it comes to foreign investment, and you can see the three big ones in front of you. It's interesting when you look at the evolution to see that initially foreign investment was not within European competence. We're seeing a progressive and gradual enlarging of the role of European bodies. And that's my key takeaway of the presentation at large. Europe is assuming greater and greater power for itself when it comes to foreign investments, right? So here you have what the treaties tell us. That's one issue. So clearly there is legal competence to regulate FDI today. But that is not enough. Investment arbitration is in European public consciousness. And that's the second issue I'd like to point out. 
This has no longer remained fuddy-duddy lawyers sitting in fancy rooms talking about law. This is something that is very real. Four years ago, I had to go to Mannheim in Germany for a presentation. Mannheim is a town in the middle of nowhere in Germany. Uh, we had the Trojan horse stop CETA, stop TTIP in the square of Mannheim. Right? So you can just see how this has really taken a life in public conscience and therefore the European Union in some senses feels obligated to respond. You see the famous, infamous, however you see the world, Vattenfall case. And then we see the renewable cases, 28 and growing, three cases, many more likely. You saw a lot of Central and Eastern European countries really facing a very severe housing crisis because of the removal of the Swiss franc currency conversions. And at the same time, enter North America, the two mega treaties, CETA with Canada and TTIP with the United States. The negotiations commence and people realize that we may be eating shitty American food. So this becomes a very real debate. So we have seen the treaty framework. We're seeing the public awareness in Europe. And then we see that the European Commission has a very unique vision of how it would like to see investment arbitration. This is the MIC proposal that was given in CETA and in TTIP. The example I have in front of you is TTIP. They want to do away with ISDS and come out with a court-like structure. 15 people who can do nothing, five Europeans, five Americans or Canadians based on which treaty you're looking at, five rest of the world. You cannot do anything and there's a 2000 euro retainer, so hashtag first world problem, who's going to want to serve on this panel. But what makes it a court is the fact that there's going to be an appellate body, right? Following the two, two and two structure. Slightly better pay, so if you have a choice, you may want to sit on this court, not on the first, uh, on the tribunal of the first instance. But now we are seeing a third issue, a third way Europeans want to look at ISDS differently. Uh, this is their goal of creating harmonization. I just point out every treaty right now has a different mix. So at some stage we are going to get into a variety of mix which the Europeans tell us will merge at some stage. Nobody knows how, but there will be a super mix at some stage. And then enter ACMEA, uh, the famous infamous case again. Here you have an intra EU BIT. There is an award in favor of the investor. Slovakia challenges the matter in the seat. Germany. Germany refers it to the European Code of Justice, and the European Code of Justice tells us boom, 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 stay tuned. ISTS incompatible with EU law. Bizarrely, they tell us the ruling doesn't apply to commercial arbitration. Now, the reasoning here was investment tribunals can look at EU law and, you know, EU law, sole competence, exclusive competence. Well, that can equally happen in commercial arbitration, but shh, no good reason given there. This is serious. You have Last two years ago, I'm losing time, but everyone terminated 2000, the year because of COVID. So 2019, you have the declaration by the states that tell us ISDS clauses contrary to union law. And then you have the plurilateral treaty that gets rid of intra-EU treaties, but it also terminates the sunset clause. If what is the effect? The treaties are terminated and they die immediately. They don't tell us anything about the Energy Charter Treaty. Fear not, the European Court of Justice will fix that. This treaty has been signed by 23 states. Four have abstained. Three of the four are key investors involved in disputes, so you can sort of understand why they kept silent. 
Uh, Ireland, we put a question mark, oh, Ireland. But that's where we are right now. Just to sum up, and this will sort of set the stage, right? We heard about this just a few months ago. The European Code of Justice tells us that the Energy Charter Treaty that involves both EU and non-EU members, and this was the big controversy, what happens with the ECT? They tell us now that the ECJ cannot, uh, that, that, that the ECT cannot be used to resolve intra-EU bits. We're also told that ad hoc agreements cannot be the basis for arbitration disputes between intra-EU cases. This is the PL Holdings case. Uh, this is a very personal case for me because Professor George Berman, somebody whom we all admire, was the chair, and I've heard his views on this matter. Let me just end by saying this is a turbulent time. Uh, ISDS definitely needs to be reformed, but I do want to put one final thought here. In any other situation, if you had judiciaries coming out and telling you what you can and cannot do, we would scream bloody murder. The outrage that people should have here at the fact that you are having a mega body telling states what they can and cannot do for that reason should be condemned. That is separate from the fact that we should be reforming the process and that we need to rethink investment policy. We should not be creating exceptions to what are largely white nations. And with that provocative statement, I am going to end and pass the floor back to Professor Baltag. Thank you very much, uh, Kabir. Um, I, it, it feels like the ground is shaking uh, and uh, a lot of emphasis uh, was uh, was put on the Energy Charter Treaty uh, and uh, it's a hot topic at the moment, in particular because we're going through a modernization process. I'd like to ask Simon to add maybe his uh, brief comments on where the Energy Charter Treaty stands in this discussion, but without uh, looking into the future of it. Sounds good. Thank you, Krina, and uh, thanks to the uh, Czech Ministry of Finance for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So for the last two decades, dozens of intra-EU claims have been filed under the ECT, many of which resulted in significant awards. Most recently, the ECT was the key instrument invoked in the series of claims filed against Spain, Italy, and other European countries concerning regulations in the renewable energy sector. The respondent states and the European Commission, as a non-disputing party, have argued in the arbitrations that the ECT does not apply to intra-EU claims but arbitral tribunals have consistently rejected that position. They've relied on, the, on some of the same ground as, as those relied upon by tribunals that have rejected the ACME objection, but they've also relied on grounds that are specific to the ECT, including the fact that it's a multilateral treaty that also applies to non-EU states, the fact that the EU itself is a party to the ECT, and the fact that the ECT doesn't include a disconnection clause, even though the EU proposed to include one during the negotiations. In their January 2019 declaration committing to terminate intra-EU BITs, the majority of EU states expressed a view that arbitration of intra-EU claims under the ECT was also incompatible with EU law. Declaration, the declaration we know was not unanimous, and in fact, it has not swayed arbitral tribunals so far. In Escosol v. Italy, for example, the tribunal found that the declaration was not supported by the ACMEA judgment, which does not specifically cover the ECT. And in any event, it was merely a, quote, statement of current political will, close quote, rather than a binding interpretation of the ECT. The termination agreement that was concluded in May 2020 covered only intra-EU BITs stated in its preamble that proceedings under the ECT were excluded from its scope and that, quote, the EU and its member states will deal with this matter at a later stage. In parallel, the contracting parties to the ECT initiated in 2018 a process to modernize the provisions of the treaty, as you mentioned. The issue of intra-EU claims came up when discussing the status of members of regional economic integration organizations, as that term is used in the ECT. 
And the negotiations on this topic appear to be ongoing, although there's limited information. So this is the context in which the CJAU's decision in Comstroy was rendered this year, finding that the ECT did not apply to intra-EU claims. The decision essentially transposed the reasoning of ACMEA to the context of the ECT. I know we're planning to discuss this significant development in more detail, so I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, indeed, um, I, I would I would uh, give the virtual floor to Veronica because, as you could hear, we had a very busy year, uh, and uh, and probably will will discuss as well the consequences, immediate consequences. We have already one question from the audience uh, on, on this aspect. What are the immediate consequences of the two? Um, judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union in uh, Moldova versus Comstroy and Poland versus PL Holdings. And I would say that this judgments, uh, and I would uh, um, I would just wanted to highlight, especially because Tom Sikora is uh, in our panel today, uh, I, I would like to commend the wonderful panel yesterday uh, uh, organized by the IBA and ITA on uh, this particular topic and uh, with the participation of uh, first Advocate General Professor Spunzar. And, and I think uh, we, 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 th there are certain elements um, raised by these two judgments that we're going to discuss today, but of course we don't have time to exhaust them. And I would, I would probably ask Veron Veronica to, to look at these two uh, judgments in more detail and confirm uh, or not my uh, understanding that they actually ex expand the effects of ACMEA judgment. Veronica. Thank you very much, Krina. Um, I shall happily do so. Um, but before doing that, let me just say two words of thank you for the invitation to the um, um, Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic. It's a pleasure to be on such a distinguished panel as this one, um, discussing important developments um, such as the Comstroy and PL Holding ones. And if I may say so, if there is one good thing that has come out of this intra-EU debate and investment arbitration over the past 20 years, and I'm saying this as an Eastern European myself, it's that um, Central Eastern European states have been forced and allowed to grow um, their own talent and their own experts. And I think um, the Czech Ministry of Finance is, is a very good example of um, how these teams and the platforms they've uh, put in place now contribute greatly to the common thinking and the discussion on, on these important topics. So um, at least a good development there. Um, but going back to um, Krina's question, yes, 2021, an incredibly busy year. Um, and I'd like to say it's not over yet, right? We are still expecting a judgment in the Mikula case. Um, we'll have to see whether the judges are already on Christmas vacation or whether they'll be um, handing down a third um, arbitration related judgment this year. But if it doesn't come now, it certainly will in the first half of 2021. Um, I think we heard at the beginning of the conference that Comstroy and PL Holdings have um, answered many um, questions. Um, I'd uh, definitely agree with that, um, but I'd also say that there are many questions that were left unanswered. Um, and then perhaps as importantly, um, there are many new questions that these cases raise where we are just as much as loss um, uh, as we've been um, so far. But um, turning perhaps first to um, Comstroy, just following up on um, what, what Simon said. So yes, since Armea, we've had this back and forth um, over whether or not Armea extends to the Energy Charter Treaty or not. Um, we've heard the debates in front of arbitral tribunals, um, including with the participation as amicus curiae of the Commission, We've had these debates in the national courts in setting aside and enforcement proceedings. Um, we've heard the debates between member states. Again, this has been referred to the different declarations where a number of states, including my home country, Hungary, um, held and I think continue to hold a very strong view um, that Ahmea does not extend to the ECT, um, mainly for the reasons that Simon already mentioned, um, including the fact that the um, EU is a signatory to the treaty, that this is a multilateral um, treaty. And I think also many have um, placed big hopes on paragraph 57 of the EMEA judgment, which seem to suggest that in certain situations, international agreements can put in place courts um, that are entitled to issue binding interpretation of those agreements. 
Um, I think many have hoped that that would refer to the ECT and um, ECT arbitration. I think now it's clear that it was more um, directed towards SETA and um, the other um, extra EU um, investment agreements that the EU is um, um, negotiating. So here we go. Comstroy confirms that Armea does apply to um, intra-EU arbitrations. Um, the um, court found that the Energy Charter Treaty is EU law um, because the EU is a signatory to the um, Energy Charter Treaty, so that makes the treaty EU law. And by consequence, if an arbitral tribunal interprets or applies the ECT, it is interpreting and applying EU law. Second step, again, from the Ahmea trilogy, um, this arbitral tribunal constituted under the Energy Charter Treaty clearly isn't a um, court or tribunal of a member state in the sense of Article 267 of the TFEU, um, mainly because the court previously decided that it wasn't. Um, and then that takes us to the third leg of this test, um, the question whether or not there are sufficient safeguards in place that can ensure um, that the um, application and interpretation of EU law um, given by these arbitral tribunals in these awards is subject to adequate review. Um, and here the answer is no. Um, just like in Armea, the re review isn't sufficient um, to fully um, protect the um, autonomy and effectiveness of EU law. Um, so um, Armea definitely applicable to the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, now, I think we will, in the second half of the discussion, talk about what this really means. Um, but perhaps if I may just say here that it's incredibly unfortunate uh, and perhaps to some extent surprising that the court chose the Comstroy case to make these findings. Um, it's not the findings themselves which are surprising. I think that's been in the pipeline and, um, and it was to be expected that the court would continue, as Krina says, to extend its Ahmea case law. Um, but one would surely think that there were better cases in the pipeline which would have um, allowed the court to make a more legitimate finding on the intra-EU applicability um, of the Energy Charter Treaty than the Comstroy case. We've seen it in the um, judgment, perhaps we'll talk about it. The court has had to bend over backwards um, several times, um, first to um, confirm that it has jurisdiction to deal with the uh, preliminary ruling request of the Paris Court of Appeal, and then a second time, um, when it um, looking at that um, preliminary ruling request, which of course did not at all address the intra-EU applicability of the ECT, um, the court decided that in order to answer the court's request, it, it really had to do this gymnastics and um, talk about Ahmea um, under the ECT. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see the consequences, but very unfortunate. Um, there was the opinion that Belgium had requested, which would have lent itself um, to, uh, to a proper decision on these matters for the court, um, as well as the Green Tech Novaer Gernia cases from the um, Stockholm, um, Stockholm, apologies, from the Swedish um, Supreme Court, um, which, as I understand, has now been withdrawn because um, the court went ahead and said what it wanted in, um, in Comstroy. Um, now turning to PL Holdings, very briefly, um, agreed with um, Krina that there is some extension um, of the Ahmea principle there by the court. Although I would also want to say that uh, perhaps, at least to me, surprisingly, it's a very um, self-restrained extension um, of the um, of the Ahmea judgment. I think many were hoping um, to um, finally have some clarity over this commercial versus investment distinction that Kabir um, highlighted as being one of the weak points um, of the Ahmea um, judgment. And to finally understand what really is the difference um, there and to what extent um, commercial contracts and um, other agreements um, concluded with states um, of the European Union can contain um, arbitration agreements. And I'm not sure um, the court um, gave us a final answer in that regard um, because it, um, it very much limited itself to the specific facts um, of the case. Um, finding, because um, going back to the case, um, really it was a question of whether or not um, a, a member state with an investor can conclude either via contract or in any other manner um, here um, via the belated um, objection to jurisdiction, um, an arbitration agreement that is identical to an arbitration agreement that is contained in an entry UBIT and that is um, invalid because of Ahmea. Um, and so the court said to the extent um, these ad hoc or co contractual um, agreements to arbitrate are really concluded um, with the intention to circumvent the invalidity of the um, arbitration offer slash arbitration agreement contained in the BIT and have the same characteristics 
Valarmea applies um, and these agreements um, are embedded. But it's still to me, and this is open probably um, up for discussion later um, during today's um, panel, um, to what extent this gives a definite answer to all the uh, public contracts um, that we have in place um, in the EU, where commercial entities um, have um, arbitration clauses with um, state entities across the EU. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. I, I, I will just highlight from the Comstray uh, judgment, uh, and I think this is something uh, that goes to my question to Tom. Um, par paragraph 24, the fact that the agreement concern is a mixed agreement cannot as such exclude the jurisdiction of the court. And then on the interpretation, um, paragraph 49, the, as Veronica mentioned, the ECT itself is an act of EU law. Uh, and it follows that an arbitral award would be required to interpret and even apply uh, EU law. Um, Tom, do you see Cormstroy as allowing the Court of Justice to expand the treaty interpretation powers and probably to more than the notion of investment? Uh, one would go further and look into other international treaties. Uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned before, the European Commission has unsuccessfully pleaded uh, various positions as amici curiae in investment arbitration, in particular on the uh, EU law application. What is your position on this? Trina, I think the short response is, and who's going to stop them? Um, and let me thank the organizers, uh, our friends at the Czech Ministry for having me back. I'd love to be in, in Prague in person like in 2019. Alas, it was not to be. I have to say that Comstroy is a depressing decision in a truly depressing trend of decisions. One thing is certain, the Court of Justice of the European Union is getting bolder and bolder. Let's remember that before 2018, the court used to find that arbitration, whether commercial or investment, was entirely compatible of and decision 117 with respect to the CETA treaty. Um, and now suddenly, and, and actually contrary to the opinion of, of its own advocate general, the former Belgian uh, CJU judge Melchior Vachelet that um, Karina cited, the court finds ISDS entirely incompat incompatible with articles 267 and 344 of TFU. That was a bold and radical about face. And at least for a purely American trained lawyer, a bridge way, way too far. <clears throat> Basically, the, for the court to be right, the court has to assume that any intra EU ISDS case is a dispute concerning the interpretation or the application of the treaties, close quote, quoting from Article 344 of TFU. And that's you know, an unsupportable proposition. Most ISDS cases have very little to do with EU treaty interpretation. And if they, even if they did, or even if they applied EU law, the CETA approach endorsed by the court only four years ago says that you can examine and apply EU law, but that's not equivalent to an, an interpretation by an EU court. It's just domestic EU law being taken into account by a, a tribunal, uh, but it is certainly then obliged to follow the prevailing interpretation given uh, to EU law by domestic courts. And most importantly, which courts are then not bound by the meaning given by the CETA tribunal. That was a very elegant solution. Um, and now with respect to Comstra, we have a situation where merely because it's a it's a third state case that's seated in France, the court construes the meaning of a multilateral treaty. And that's the key, it's a multilateral treaty. The situation is somewhat unique because unlike in the BIT paradigm of Achmea, the EU is itself a member of the ECT. But normally it is either a tribunal created under a treaty that construes that treaty or the parties jointly verify the meaning. A unilateral declaration as to the meaning of a treaty is, well, it's meaningless to the extent it is issued not just for a party's internal use, but meant for other parties. And here the court on behalf of the EU is not speaking for its own use, but attempting to declare the meaning for all EU member states. 
Well, that indeed smacks of supremacy of EU law coming in through the back door. Having construed a treaty term, what is there to stop the court from additional treaty interpretation? We may see more of that in this space simply because there's no one to stop the court from doing so. And the court is growing increasingly bold. I will, I will end by saying, we know that because we are now in Prague and, uh, and our Czech friends are, are more than anyone of the power of the, of, uh, of the CJU. Because in fact, just very recently, the vice president of the court granted an interim injunction um, ordering Poland to shut its Turów lignite mine. And the interesting aspect of that is that was not a final judgment. It was an interim measure. Uh, historically, interim measures are always conservatory measures that are preserving the race in dispute, not impairing the race in dispute, but not here. And that is why I say the court is getting bolder all the time. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, I just wanted to bring to the attention uh, and move to the next question, but uh, uh, very much related to your comments. Um, it was reported that the European Commission has sent a letter to the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy in relation to the pending anti-arbitration proceedings lodged by the Netherlands before uh, a German court to stall the RWE versus Netherlands exit arbitration. And uh, I think uh, uh, the audience is quite familiar with this exit case and other similar cases um, uh, in, in the context of transitional to transitioning to a cleaner energy under the EU um, uh, energy uh, package uh, with the uh, with the um, uh, closing the fossil fuel uh, investments across Europe. Apparently, uh, according to this letter, the European Commission opines that the exit convention can be interpreted in conformity with EU law if the court decides that the respondent's consent to arbitration is lacking in the case of intra-EU arbitrations. So this is an exit arbitration. Uh, the European Commission adds that if the German court finds that such an interpretation is impossible, then the judges are under duty to disapply the exit convention in application of the principles of primacy of EU law. Simon, the difficult question, in the current scenario, what are the effects of ACME Acom's repeal holdings? and the treaty of the termination of the intra-UBITs. We heard Kabir, no uh, uh, sunset clauses there. Uh, on the recognition and enforcement of intra-EU arbitral awards. Uh, you have to unmute uh, yourself, Simon. Sorry about that. Thank you, Krina. Uh, so as we mentioned, arbitral tribunals continue to find that they have jurisdiction over intra-EU claims and to render significant awards against EU states under intra-EU BATs and the ECT. Well, it's one thing to render awards, it's another thing to enforce them. EU states cannot comply voluntarily with the awards because of ACMEA, Comstroy, PL Holdings, and the Termination Agreement. In fact, EU states have an affirmative obligation under the Termination Agreement to seek the setting aside of awards under intra-EU BATs and to resist their enforcement before the courts in both EU and non-EU countries. After Comstroy, there's little doubt that EU states will also resist enforcement of ECT awards. To obtain payment, claimants must therefore enforce the awards in countries where the respondent states have assets. That's precisely what they have attempt attempted to do in a series of cases both in the EU and outside the EU. These developments raise complex questions, and I'll briefly touch upon four different enforcement scenarios in the EU and outside the EU, and in each case, exit and non-exit. The first scenario is probably the most straightforward, enforcement of a non-exit award in the EU. States can resist enforcement of non-exit awards based on the grounds set forth in the New York Convention, including invalidity of the arbitration agreement, lack of jurisdiction, so there's a clear rubric under which states can present the intra-EU objection. In the EU, the courts have to uphold that objection because they're bound to render decisions that comply with the EU treaties. 
That's exactly what the German federal court held in October 2018, finding that the ACMEA award had to be set aside in order to comply with the CJU's decision in that case. The Higher Regional Court of Frankfurt in February of this year also reportedly found that arbitration under the Austria-Croatia BIT, so a different treaty from one, the one in ACMEA, was incompatible with the EU treaties. We can expect similar decisions from European courts in other cases, including in PR holdings where the Supreme Court of Sweden will likely set aside the award following the CJU's decision in that case. Second scenario, still in the EU, but for exit awards. The difference is that a state cannot resist enforcement of exit awards before national courts based on the grounds set forth in the New York Convention. Challenges to exit awards are normally brought before exit ad hoc committees based on the grounds in Article 52 of the Exit Convention. And Article 54 provides that the contracting states have an obligation to recognize an exit award as binding and enforce the pecuniary obligations imposed by the award, quote, as if it were a final judgment of a court in that state, close quote. How does this play out in the context of enforcement of exit awards in the EU? Not aware of decisions ruling precisely on this point, but recent decisions rendered by courts in Sweden and the UK concerning the Mikula exit award are instructive. As you may know, the European Commission in Mikula decided the payment of the award by Romania would constitute state aid incompatible with EU law. So national courts have had to assess whether the Commission's decision could be invoked as a ground for refusing to enforce the Mikula award. Two main approaches seem to be emerging. The first one is reflected in the decision of the District Court of NACA in Sweden in January 2019, finding that the obligation to enforce an exit award as if it were a final judgment did not mean that the award could automatically be enforced. It held that Romania could resist enforcement since, quote, a Swedish judgment of this type whose enforcement was in violation of EU law could not have been enforced either in Sweden. It's a translation of how. The second approach is reflected in the decision of the Supreme Court of the UK of February 2020 in Mikula. Among other grounds for rejecting Romania's request for a state of enforcement, the court found that the obligation to treat an exit award as a final judgment preserved the ability to present defenses only to the execution of awards on state assets. Article 54 could not be used to invoke grounds for resisting recognition and enforcement of the award. In an article on intra-EU claims to be published in the next issue of the ICC bulletin, the authors commented that the UK Supreme Court in this case, quote, killed two birds with one stone and emancipated the UK from the ECJ's oversight and boosted the attractivity of the UK and London in the eyes of worldwide award creditors, close quote, go Brexit. Let's now turn to enforcement outside the EU. In non-exit cases, states in the EU will still be able to rely on the intra-EU objection as a ground for resisting enforcement under the New York Convention. But non-EU courts have no direct obligation to comply with the EU treaty. So there's a question mark as to the extent to which the courts will consider the objection. One relevant factor may be the seat of the arbitration. If the seat is in the EU and the award has been set aside, there are ongoing setting aside proceedings, a non-EU court may well decide to take that into account. That's what the US District Court for the District of Columbia did when it stayed the enforcement of the Nova Energia v. Spain award due to the ongoing setting aside proceedings in Sweden. The fourth scenario concerns enforcement of exit awards outside the EU. A non-EU court enforcing an exit award as if it were a final judgment will not be directly affected by the status of intra-EU awards under the EU treaties. The question is whether there may be an indirect effect based on doctrines that may require consideration of the impact of the EU treaties on the enforcement of national judgments. There are a few relevant decisions so far on this point. Mikula, the District Court for the District of Columbia, considered defenses based on the Act of State foreign compulsion doctrines under US law, rejected them on the merits based on the circumstances of the case. In Australia, a lower court accepted to enforce the exit award rendered in Antin v. Spain, but it's not clear from the decision whether any similar defenses were advanced. I was going to mention the, the, the letter 
uh, Krina, that uh, you described from the European Commission to Dutch government, but I'll skip over that to uh, the end of a minute. Um, it's going to add one thing, which is that these developments um, in the EU seem to have a deterrent effect on intra-EU claims. For example, a claimer that had initiated an intra-EU claim against Denmark recently notified ICSID that he was abandoning his claims. In his letter to ICSID, the claimant stated that he was confident that the ACME objection would have been rejected, but that he had decided to withdraw his claims because of the termination agreement and in light of the costs of pursuing exit cases. So it's becoming more and more difficult to pursue intra-EU claims, given the difficult questions they raise, including at the enforcement stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And, and I, I was wondering if, uh, go, going back to um, your reference to the case against Denmark, um, one of the reasons um, highlighted by the investors was exactly that um, it is likely that, that Denmark will refuse to voluntarily enforce any exceed arbitral award uh, rendering this case because of the intra-EU element. Right. Um, so do you think that we are going to see this, uh, this kind of developments in the future uh, on a continuous basis? Yes, I think that's where we're headed. Kabir, from the perspective of the US courts, we heard a bit from Simon, and I was wondering if you see any particular approach uh, or maybe uniform approach of the US courts with respect to any intra-EU arbitral awards. Let me just start off with a couple of initial quick comments. Initial comment one. A lot of this is coming out from Europe at a mind boggling, bogglingly speed. They're all also very recent. So some of this has not been tested before US courts yet. Right. The two decisions that have been subject of discussion are just too recent. What we can do, and this is my second point, is look at what the US courts have done in other situations, and I think Mikula becomes the best example. And here's the big takeaway. The US courts are not bound by Europe, either for better or worse. So all the bullying, cajoling, or canvassing that the European institutions can do to European states don't apply to American courts. And in the Mikula case, when the Akmea objection was raised, the court proverbially, I'm going to paraphrase what they said, was Akmea, Shakmea, who cares? They went ahead and enforced it. So to that extent, some of these are very interesting decisions and developments in Europe. We may probably see a chilling effect that nobody is bringing cases. But to the extent cases are there, you are probably better off trying not to enforce it in Europe. North America, US, Canada probably give you good options, and I leave it at that. Thank you very much, Kabir. Uh, well, it much depends on the assets. Uh, let's put it there. I, I noticed that we have uh, questions from our distinguished audience, and I would like to move to the last question. Um, and I would start the question uh, with two comments, and the question is uh, addressed to Tom. Um, we heard in the beginning that there was a perfect storm allowing for uh, the intra-EU uh, investment protection approach uh, to be shifted, um, uh, gradually allowing the Court of Justice, as you mentioned, to um, assume more power uh, or unexpected power. Uh, and I would add that that perfect storm had additional elements. Uh, let's uh, not rem let's not forget that uh, the movement appeared in the context of the TTIP negotiations uh, with uh, Cecilia Malmström uh, report. Uh, later on, with the 2015 uh, recommendation of the European Parliament on having uh, in, uh, a, a court system dealing with. Uh, uh, investment disputes. Then, of course, we had ACMEA, we had Yukos case, um, uh, 
We had Philip Morris and the regulatory chill. Uh, we had the Vattenfall case. Uh, and more recently, we have the Uncitral working uh, uh, group free reform and the proposal of an MIC that Kabir mentioned. Uh, on top of this, we had the EU termination treaty and the question, uh, although I realized the elephant in the room, uh, well, where's the future? <laughs> if there is any future after our discussion today, uh, do you think that there will be no intra-EU investment protection? Will investors seek to address this void, uh, because there is a void, uh, by resorting to, for example, bilateral arrangements with states, or why not by restructuring their business to uh, gain access to uh, external EU protection? Tom. So the first thing that came to my mind when asked about the future was a line from an American movie called Kill Bill, which was expletive, you don't have a future. Uh, but seriously, um, I think there'll be a whole series of, of reactions. Those investors with existing or imminent claims may just proceed. Um, arbitration tribunals have asserted jurisdiction regardless of respondents, Achmea and ECT claims. I understand that now a large number of jurisdictional decisions, I think it's around 64, 61 of which have been ECT related, um, have rendered. And so the issue becomes enforcement. Enforcement will be impossible within the European Union, and thus foreign enforcement will become necessary. Some uh, investors may, as Simon points out, abandon their claims. Um, but point number two, I will be very interested to see whether in the future investors will sue the respondent state and also sue the European Union for breach of the ECT. So the inability to collect an ECT award within the EU member state um, will in effect be converted into a damage claim against the EU itself, which presumably the EU would have to pay if the claim were to succeed. This is an interesting idea. The EU here itself is a party to the ECT and can be sued. Point number three, for those investors who are capable of restructuring now to become an extra EU investor, why not? Why wouldn't you? They would be silly not to try. The reality is that um, restructuring isn't normally just driven by the availability of alternative BITs. In, in, in reality, it is often tax driven. It's driven by tax considerations, the presence of dividend withholding taxes and such, and the, results, and the resulting potential value leakage. Sadly, very few investors will ever give up a few percent of real annual return in return for the possibility of structuring against some future claim. So much will depend if there is an offshore option for investors which can provide investment protection for European jurisdictions without damaging the value of the investment for the investor. I would argue this is a great opportunity for some emerging jurisdictions. Four, will investment contracts replace investment treaties in the EU? This would be the Ecuadorian path. Well, Certainly, if the C CJEU has its way, clearly not. And this is the real message of PL Holdings. The CJEU will not tolerate EU member states entering into agreements that will provide investment-like protections and would be subject to investment arbitration. I think that much is clear. The political forces behind the Achmea line of decisions did not dismantle the old system only to allow, quote, circumvention of the obligations arising for state under the treaties, close quote, to quote from paragraph 47 of Peel Holdings. Five, many investors, particularly small invest, smaller investors, will simply not be able to restructure. For them, the investment decision will become much more difficult. And the consequence is that there is going to be just less investment and terms will have to be better. Maybe that is not going to be a material consideration for many Western democracies with a generally rational legislature uh, 
and well-developed and generally reliable judiciaries. But it is going to be an issue in places where modern Western-style democracy is still veneer thin and corruption, nepotism, and resulted or decisions run deep towards in places where investment is most needed. And sadly, those states will be net losers as a result of these developments. And because ISDS has also a beneficial rule of law effect on jurisdictions subject to it, the population of those states will also be net losers as there will be often no barrier to what economists call naked rent-seeking behavior. Six, the European Commission has promised us legislative initiatives to develop protections for intra-EU investment. So far, nothing has been produced, but I would not discount the project entirely. I drive around Central and Eastern Europe a lot, and there is just so much Western European, often German investment. Historically, these investors were able to make sure um, to sue or just threaten to sue, which often itself produces a resolution. In the brave new world, post Achmea, post Comstroy, that will be very difficult. And so I would imagine that they will push their governments to devise alternative protections and alternative remedies to be made available to them. And thus these governments will probably pu push Brussels and it will be interesting to see what Brussels will eventually propose and whether it will be sufficiently effective. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Karina. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, I would uh, I would turn to a follow up question uh, before we take the questions from the audience uh, to Veronica, because I don't want to leave the energy charter treaty unattended. Uh, and uh, we discussed the uh, well referred to the modernization process. Um, how do you see the future of the Energy Charter Treaty? We had the fifth session of the uh, modernization group uh, uh, now in November. Uh, and um, at least uh, as I understand it, in, in the light of, uh, of Comstroy, where the court said um, the establishment of the seat of arbitration on the territory of the member state, in this case, France, uh, as you mentioned uh, in your earlier comment was sufficient. Uh, taking these two elements together, how how do you see the future of the Energy Charter Treaty, and if there is any room for any uh, investment uh, arbitration on the territory of any EU member state uh, in the context of the Energy Charter Treaty? Um, thank you, Krina. Um, to answer your question, I think I'd first look at the um, Energy Charter Treaty in the immediate future in the intra-EU context and then um, talk a bit about the modernization process. Um, and of course, these two coexist. Um, so we will also have to take that into account. Um, but assuming that the ECT stays in place as it is um, for just a few more years, um, in the intra-EU context post Comstroy, um, I would expect a rather similar process to take place um, as the one we witnessed post Ahmea. Um, meaning, um, and this has already been referred to, um, arbitral tribunals to not draw the consequences that the court and the commission would like them to draw from Comstroy. Um, so um, I expect um, no tribunal to decline jurisdiction because of Comstroy. Um, secondly, I also don't think that investors in the immediate future will refrain from bringing energy charter treaty claims. Um, it's rather like Tom mentioned, perhaps um, investors who've been playing with the idea of bringing a claim that they might be encouraged to bring that claim um, as quickly as possible. Um, we'll see, but as a matter of fact, it for sure is um, um, clear that even after Comstroy, um, we've already had two new um, intra-EU ECT claims um, filed in front of um, ICSID, um, one by um, Austrian investors against Romania, that's the most recent, um, and the German um, claim against Spain. Um, so business as usual um, there too, just like we've seen with Achmea, where investors continue to rely on intra-EU BITs, in particular, although not exclusively, to bring arbitrations under the Energy Charter Treaty um, for all the enforcement considerations that have been mentioned before. Um, and perhaps because of these two first 
consequences or rather non-consequences of Comstroy, um, I would not be surprised if um, the Commission and the Member States felt that there was a need to give effect to Comstroy, um, as there was a need to give effect to Hermea by way of a treaty. Um, and here, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think there are various options. Um, one that ties in with the modernization process. Um, we obviously all know that the article um, Article 26 of the ECT is not amongst the uh, provisions that are being reviewed um, by the um, working group. Um, but who knows, maybe the court felt that it had to um, jump on Comstroy and make it findings here, um, although they were absolutely not welcome, um, in order to allow the EU delegation um, to have a bigger voice in saying, well, really, the modernization process needs to disconnect in the intra-EU context the Energy Charter Treaty to be seen. Um, but if that's not the case, um, I, th I think this has been discussed, but um, I, would, I would not be surprised if a um, disconnection treaty were to come between um, the EU member states and the um, European Union in respect to the um, Energy Charter Treaty, obviously bearing in mind that Italy is no longer um, a member, although the um, survivor clause still um, stands. Um, so Article 41 of the Vienna Convention um, allows um, some of the signatories to multilateral treaties to conclude an inter se agreement in which they amend some of the provisions of that multilateral treaty as um, in relation to to themselves. Um, the um, preconditions for that is um, no prohibition um, in the treaty itself um, and the um, the fact that the um, um, amendment to the treaty inter se um, um, should not um, impact the rights and obligations of non-concerned um, treaty parties. And I think that goes to Daniel's question, Daniel Doja, who asked the question, and that was discussed at Tom's conference yesterday as well, so we can definitely come back to that. Um, and that the um, amendment agreed by some of the signatories does not defeat the object and purpose of the ECT. So the question is, could the EU member states and the EU agree to um, remove the arbitration option from Article 26? Um, arguably, yes. Um, some would argue, well, difficult, um, in particular in light of Article 16, which says that any subsequent treaties that signatories to the ECT or some of the signatories to the ECT could enter into uh, that would be less favorable to investors than the ECT, well, then the um, ECT provisions remain. Um, so question there, um, would the disconnection treaty signed by EU member states and the EU have to also disapply Article 16 um, of, the, of the treaty? in addition to certain aspects of Article 26. Um, if they do that, would that be compatible with the object and purpose of the treaty? Um, what happens to the survival clause of the treaty? So there are, there are many questions there, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, the states felt that there was a need um, to, um, to come to an agreement and, and um, enter into a disconnection agreement rather than a termination agreement in the intra-EU context. And we will also see, um, and this has been referred to already, um, as much as there seemed to have been a loose political um, consent between the member states on Ahmea and what that meant and um, accepting the consequences of Ahmea, I think even though we now heard the court say what it said in Comstroy, um, I still think that there are a number of member states that are that are in disagreement, or at least there, there are more diverging opinions when it comes to the intra-EU applicability of the Energy Charter Treaty than, um, than we've had with um, Ahmea and um, intra-EU BITs. So perhaps it will um, take longer to, to, to come to any disconnection agreement, which, um, which will also just um, tie into more arbitral tribunals confirming jurisdiction on the basis of the ECT um, and more investors bringing, um, in particular, exit arbitrations um, on the basis of the ECT if they can. Um, I think you've referred to a couple of other points. I think the uh, the general modernization process, which is speeding up, um, so they're meeting again in December and um, We'll, we'll see where that goes um, and what it will do. But I think maybe the second panel will address the future of the Energy Charter Treaty more generally um, because it's under heavy criticism um, for many things, but including also for its alleged or perceived um, you know, obstacle that it poses to energy transition. Um, the um, um, Corporate Europe Observatory with the uh, one treaty to rule them all um, document and and um, and movie have um, seemingly um, 
impacted public opinion very strongly. And I think that idea um, that the ECT is as a treaty per se, um, the wrong way to go. Is, is very strong there, but I think that the second panel will, will talk about that. So last but not least, your question about um, non-EU member states, will they want to um, continue to rely on the ECT with um, arbitral tribunals seated in the EU? Um, remains to be seen. I mean, we, we, we've seen that the Court of Justice in this Comstra instance jumped on the occasion to interpret the ECT. Um, I'm not sure it will jump on future occasions as well, because really I, I'm not sure it was interested in interpreting the notion of investor in the ECT, which it really did um, like a lazy student. Um, by the way, um, you know, I, I marked something, but I really didn't argue um, my answer. Um, so to me, it was really because it wanted to get the Sahmea thing off its chest. Um, so I don't know whether in the future, if preliminary ruling requests were sent to the court, whether it would also bend um, over backwards to say, well, I do have jurisdiction um, to, to be seen. Um, but we've seen that if the court does, um, it seems to hold a rather conservative view on treaties and, and treaty interpretation. Um, and so perhaps, you know, um, non-EU states who find themselves um, having to respond to investment claims on the basis of the ECT, they will continue to be happy um, to have the seat of arbitration in the EU. Um, of course, investors, um, much less so. Um, and so I think we discussed this before this conference, how this will impact the caseload of the SEC, which obviously as an arbitrary institution in front of which many um, non-EU ECT um, disputes have been brought, um, remains to be seen. I wouldn't be surprised if investors would say, um, we don't know what this court is doing, we don't know where EU law is going, and we don't know what impact this will have on our case, so let's just, um, let's just stay away altogether. That's uh, very interesting. As you said, uh, Veronica, uh, we have a question from Daniel <clears throat> and uh, I'll just take a few, few moments. I'm aware that we are already in the break and uh, we want to be respectful, uh, allowing the second panel to have their time as well. Uh, Daniel, uh, as you as you mentioned, uh, ask the question if this uh, unilateral nature of the court's ruling in Kormstroy from the point of view of the third state is uh, is in question. Can you think of a scenario where third states have an interest in the intra-EU applicability of the ECT, say through an investment held through an EU SPV? Uh, and I think this goes a little to what Veronica was saying, interpretation of jurisdictional um, points, uh, investment, investor, uh, how would that sit before uh, uh, a, a EU member state court? Remember that in Comstroy, we, we came from a, um, a, a layered uh, a decision of the French courts with the initial set aside uh, because of the notion of investment and then retracted. Uh, so quite unstable environment, one would say. Um, I, would, I would turn to Tom if you have any uh, a take on this in particular coming from the perspective of an investor uh, that obviously has uh, investments around the world. Uh, two thoughts, one preliminary thought. You know, the, the, the European Union argues that its limitations as an Achmea and Comstroy really are do not affect third parties because they only affect EU-based investors against EU member states. And that is that is intentional. Um, second thought, <clears throat> I think from the investor perspective, the investors are going to flee for the hills. Um, and London is going to become a very uh, desirable seat for investment arbitration. Uh, and ICSID is going to become a much more desirable institution as opposed to Uncetral or, or SCC. Because one thing investors cannot tolerate is material additional risk. Investors have their own uh, commercial risks, their own technical risk. We call it the, the risk in, you know, within the field in the oil industry. But when it comes to risks above the field, beyond the field, you want to minimize them as much as possible. And in a really material investment, the last thing you want to do is arbitrate for five years and then discover that you cannot enforce the award. Similar to what the investor in the case uh, against Denmark, uh, as Simon has mentioned earlier. Thank you very much, Tom. We have a question received from Todd Weiler. 
Uh, thank you, Todd. Assuming that the European Court of Justice dubiously reasoned Comstroy decision is implemented by the French courts, which seems a foregone conclusion, query whether such implementation would be contrary to the French Ukraine BIT's fair and equitable treatment and or expropriation standards. Uh, Kabir. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I think Todd is being provocative there. Yes. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. This is Todd being Todd. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. And maybe, maybe Simon wants to add to this uh, question mark added by Kabir, uh, whether we see this uh, as a breach of the treaty and taking take it elsewhere. Let's put it this way. I think this is probably where Todd is uh, aiming at. Uh, you have a new breach of the treaty, and then you try to remove it from the intra-EU. Simon? Uh, I agree with Kabir, actually. This is probably a Professor Weiler being creative. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, we have from Sabine Conrad as well. Do you anticipate that the EU states will try to get anti-suit injunctions using the term loosely, against arbitrators physically located in the EU. We have seen an article by a COM representative calling the conduct of arbitrators rebellion. Any immediate thoughts on this? I don't know whether we mean arbitrators in particular or arbitration proceedings. Um, with arbitration proceedings, we've obviously seen that Croatia was the first one to successfully um, employ that weapon, um, and it continues to do so. And um, now Netherlands is a copycat. Um, so okay, can you say Serena arbitrators? arbitrators. Yes. I recommend to, to Sabina and the European states catching the arbitrator at the airport and quickly kidnapping her or him and sending him back home, which is what, 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 yeah, as we know, has been tried in prior cases. <laughs> and, the, and the final question uh, uh, with the, uh, and I, I appreciate that the chat is very lively. Uh, thank you very much to the audience. Uh, the last question, which uh, I would say summarizes our discussion today, uh, posed by James Sonde. How difficult will it be to pursue intra-EU claims and won't, be, won't this be a clog in the wheel of investment expansion within the EU member states? Tom alluded to this. Is there anything to add? Well, I will add one thing. So we're looking at energy transition. I've seen that some estimates um, assess the, the investment required for energy transition at something on the order of 170 trillion US dollars. That money can never come from sovereigns alone. It's going to have to come from private sector investment. And <clears throat> maybe Federal Republic of Germany, but in other member states that are much less capital rich, that's going to be a really, a really significant problem. How do you fund energy transition while at the same time not being able to provide any investment guarantees to the investors? Veronica? I would second that, although, um, again, we, we live in this investment arbitration world, and I think to us this is very important, um, and Tom knows best, and um, I, you know, um, so these are just um, humble thoughts, but again, I, I think perhaps to investors more generally, um, investment protection is really subsidiary. Um, it's the business opportunity that counts, and perhaps when you take out financing to realize your investment, the existence um, of um, an investment treaty protection is taken into account to calculate at what conditions you're obtaining that financing. Um, but I'm not entirely sure, um, but this is coming from somebody who lives in this world that rather than in the general business world, um, I'm, I'm not sure that um, countries that for whatever reason still present a good business opportunity, a good investment opportunity, um, will see investment go elsewhere merely um, because they are a member state of the European Union um, and the um, court is doing what it is doing. Simon? Well, maybe I'll use a, a phrase that Tom may be familiar with um, because it comes from the oil and gas sector, which is geology trumps all. And um, 
that quote suggests, um, like Veronica mentioned, that what matters at the end of the day is the economic opportunity for um, for the investor. And I have no doubt that companies are going to try to scare uh, countries, which is what they're doing as part of their, you know, especially big companies, trying to scare uh, developing countries into thinking that these are extremely important first priority uh, kinds of guarantees that you need, when in fact that's simply not true. Kabir, final sure. word. The world will not come to an end. Europe will be fine. We will improvise and come up with different techniques. I mean, investment contracts existed before BITs existed. <laughs> you know, there are all these other ideas. Uh, this has become popular and probably easy, but I think I'm not going to cry that Europe is going to come to an end and investment. Ah, who's going to go to Europe? That's just not going to happen. So we will get through this and we will all be fine. Thank you very much. Uh, final thought from me. We still have uh, the request for from Belgium for an opinion from the Court of Justice of the European Union. Veronica mentioned Mikola. Add Belgium uh, question to the Court of Justice whether uh, the ECT applies in tri-EU. Watch the space because as Tom mentioned, the European Commission uh, has concluded the consultation regarding cross-border investment within EU and probably soon we're going to see the replacement mechanism. Um, I would like to thank the panel, uh, the organizers. Uh, I would like to thank the second panel for the indulgence and all the those listening and uh, watching us. Thank you very much. Uh, back to Martin. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, what an awesome discussion. Um, well, we've uh, ran uh, into a little delay, so um, I can offer the next panel to either do five minute break or just to skip it and and start with their panel as, as I've learned uh, some of you uh, need to finish uh, uh, as planned. So maybe Mallory, could you maybe just confirm if, if, if you want to go ahead or, or if you want to take a break, please? Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. Let me take a second to get everyone up on the screen, but we can get started as soon as everyone is up. OK, uh, I think everyone is there. Uh, Michal, can you just confirm? Wonderful. So the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here today. As others have mentioned, it would be lovely to be with everyone in Prague, but it is still nonetheless wonderful to be a part of this excellent program filled with fantastic speakers. Before introducing those speakers, I want to take a second to thank the Czech Ministry of Finance team, and in particular, Deputy Minister Landa, Martina Matejova, Jara Kuderna, and Martin Novacek for organizing this event. And now let's turn to the panelists. So when we were discussing what we would be discussing today, we went on for quite some time, and for me, it was just a fascinating exercise to sit and listen to these stellar members of our field. I don't want to interfere with your ability to listen to them, so I will keep this brief and turn things over to them quickly. But today, you will be hearing first from Annette Magnuson, who is the co-founder of Climate Change Council in Stockholm. And you, of course, no doubt will also know her from the decade plus that she spent as the Secretary General of the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. In addition to this, and in addition to sitting as arbitrator, Annette is also the founder of the crowdsourcing initiative Stockholm Treaty Lab, which seeks to create opportunities for green investment and which was shortlisted in 2017 for a Financial Times Innovation Award. You also will be hearing from Sabina Conrad, who is a partner at Morgan Lewis in Frankfurt, and her work basically spans the globe. As counsel, Sabina has represented both investors and states in various ISDS cases relating to environmental issues and energy issues, 
including representing Germany in the Vattenfall case. Sabina also sits as an arbitrator and has been on the ICSID roster since 2007 and also founded the famous Frankfurt Mood Competition. For her part, Erica Stein is a partner at Deckard based in Paris and Brussels, and she too has extensive experience as counsel in investor state arbitration as well as commercial arbitration. And she has sat as an arbitrator in numerous cases under various arbitral rules including those of the ICC, where Erica worked for six years. Finally, Patrick Pearsall is a partner at Allen & Overy based in Washington, D.C. And in addition to his work in private practice, which has included representing both states and investors in ISDS proceedings, Patrick also spent more than a decade in the United States State Department. In that capacity, Patrick not only represented the United States in ISDS cases, but he also led the negotiation of several bilateral and multilateral treaties. Now, as we will be talking about ISDS and the environment today, we figured that we would first give an overview of where it is that ISDS fits into the broader legal and practical real world environment. So I will turn it over to Annette to kick things off by discussing the bigger picture. Thank you very much, Mallory, and uh, good evening, everyone. And also, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to take part in this panel and, and this conference this afternoon. It's a true pleasure. So as Mallory alluded to, we will start with sort of the bigger picture and then we'll drill down into the specifics of disputes and, and perhaps even the future. Uh, and my task uh, will be to, to give sort of a bird's eye perspective of ISDS and the environment. And in the in the conversations we had leading up to this panel, we focused quite a lot, perhaps not surprisingly, on climate change issues under the umbrella of the environment. So that's really will be part of what I will be addressing here as I give sort of the, the starting point for our discussions. Um, and I think as arbitration specialists here, all uh, listening in here on this call, I think we can sort of all uh, sympathize with the fact that whatever happens in international disputes is a mere reflection of the real world around the disputes. And I think the, uh, the, the, the first, the panel right before us is a very good illustration of just this. Uh, and in the 20 or so, or so years that I have been involved in international arbitration, I have, and so have many of you, of course, been able to witness how um, international business have become more globalized, how corporations have become larger and how deals have become more complex. And in parallel, of course, so has international disputes. Um, and uh, this is, again, this is a natural uh, element of the fact that disputes, they reflect and whatever happens in disputes is a reflection of the world around it. And when we talk about environmental disputes, in particular climate change related issues, um, there is no difference. Uh, the rising focus of climate change issues and environmental issues, we have seen it um, to some extent already, and I think we will see more of it. future. It will be just to mention a few things of what is relevant when we talk about the world around us in, ter in these terms, when we talk about climate change and international environmental issues. Um, what are the details of climate change uh, in, in, this, in this bigger picture that could be relevant that may play out in disputes going forward or to some extent is already being played out? And a bird's eye, pers bird's eye perspective on climate change um, and from a general perspective, of course, a good starting point there is the COP26 that was just concluded in Glasgow. And, and a few observations from, COP, from the COP26 um, that I heard through the grapevine, so to speak. Uh, we are now at the point in time where nobody needs convincing that climate change is happening. Um, this, uh, this, of course, is good, good news, and I think there are many reasons for that. Uh, second, there are... Um, at the COP26 this year, at the Climate Change Conference, there were a record number of participants for business and non-governmental actors. Uh, and by many of the participants, this was also referred to as a major shift. There were many participants for the private sector in Paris, for the Paris Agreement, but not to the extent that we saw in Glasgow. Uh, and the third interesting development that I think is relevant for this audience is that commercial lawyers now are more present in, in the discussions at the meeting and also the, at the events surrounding the meeting. And by commercial lawyers, of course, I also mean then um, the private practitioners in public international law. So 
So I was talking to the Swedish head of delegation of the COP26 right after the meeting and his main takeaways from Glasgow. Um, and he talks about a continued momentum that now we will, for example, see annual updates from states on their on their ambitions under the Paris Agreement, the, the so-called National Determined Contributions, the NDCs, who will be reported now every year as opposed to five, every five years earlier. So the, the momentum uh, is hopefully increasing. We have seen that rules have been agreed under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, um, and this is where the private sector can really move in to play a role when it comes to uh, achieving the targets or the goals under the Paris Agreement. Uh, this, uh, the voluntary carbon markets and the like, so that's the good news. Um, and targets on financing have become clearer. So these were some of the takeaways from the Swedish head of delegation. So if you want to translate all of this into international investment law context, I think there are three points that can be, be made that could be relevant for our continued discussion on how sort of how to interpret treaties or how treaty texts are evolving and what we can expect to see before international courts and tribunals. The first uh, point to be made, I think, is that we are in a transition. Um, we, we know that fossil fuel needs to be phased out uh, at some point in time for us to meet the 1.5 degree targets under the Paris Agreement. Fossil fuel needs to be replaced, uh, but this will not happen overnight. But again, it is a, a transition and, and the transition is also relevant for transport, for land use buildings and sort of general inf infrastructure. But it is a major transition across all societies. Second, private capital and investments are necessary to meet the targets uh, that, we, that we are looking for, the 1.5 degree targets, um, but also that investors are actually looking for net zero projects. So during the finance day in Glasgow, the Glasgow Alliance for Net Zero announced commitments of 130 trillion US dollars from the private sector, which is extraordinary. But the, the money, if you want, you could call it that, the money is in, is in search for projects. We, uh, there needs to be net zero projects. Um, there are a number of reports out there um, confirming or emphasizing the large, the scale of things when it comes to the investments. Just the sums are just staggering. Um, the, the International Renewable Energy Agency, for example, predicts that uh, 4 trillion US dollars needs to be invested annually between now and 2050 for net zero to happen. Um, what is interesting also is that International Energy Agency says that reducing the risks for investors is essential to mobilize capital for large scale infrastructure investments and to ensure a successful transition. So that's an interesting observation. And the third issue that I think is relevant for this discussion is that business and policymakers need to work in tandem to ensure success. The capital is needed and so are the rules. It's not one or the other and they need to again, work together to, to make this transition happen. So three observations, we are in a transition, um, private capital and investments are really, really necessary to meet the targets. And third, business and policymakers need to work together to ensure the success in this massive, massive undertaking that we have ahead of us and this, um, th this big societal shift that will not happen overnight. I cannot stress this enough, but we need to be on that road going forward. Um, so, why, where does this leave then international investment law and what can we ex expect to see in international cases? And have we seen already elements of this in international cases? Um, I think I will uh, leave that to uh, members of my panel and I will stop here. Annette, you did the transition for me. I, I was going to ask Sabina next, what, in what ways this has translated to cases so far, what cases we might expect to see in the future. Um, could you give us a sense of the fact patterns that tribunals have dealt with already and what might be to come? So I think what Annette mentioned, uh, and that's important to bear in mind, investments, especially in such a mega project as stopping climate change, or at least mitigating climate change, um, need predictability and need protection. And interestingly, it was also um, private investors that were at the root of uh, the creation of international environmental law. Um, it's not a new topic. It's broader than climate change. Um, the first arbitration on international environmental law was in 1892, the good old Bering Sea arbitration. Now, bringing us, um, bringing us to the present, um, 
most people you talk to and uh, you can read in the press about the criticism against the Energy Charter Treaty, oh, this is all about protecting old energy, protecting coal, protecting nuclear, although, you know, views may be split on nu on nuclear energy and climate change. Um, we need to get rid of the Energy Charter Treaty. I try to teach people that if you look at the numbers, it's quite different. Almost 80% of all cases relate to renewable energy projects. Spain was mentioned already, um, Czech Republic was mentioned, there are um, other states in Europe uh, that are facing a few fewer cases, but still cases, uh, including Germany that has two cases against it, uh, it on renewable energy. But none of these cases are COP26 related or climate change related. They're not cases that originate from measures that states undertake to protect the environment to stop climate change. Uh, yes, we have the coal exit uh, case in the Netherlands, but it is not that many, not as many as you would expect. Maybe that will change in the not too distant future, but that depends on state behavior. And I think one lesson for states to take away from the case, uh, the case law is don't expropriate, because if you expropriate that, e even for environmental purposes, that carries the compensation obligation. We've seen that with the Santa Elena case, the Unglaube cases in Costa Rica, which were for the protection of a marine park for turtles in the case of um, of the Unglaubs. I don't recall exactly what the purpose was in Santa Elena. And there were some rumblings that there was uh, a branch of the United States government somehow involved with the investment in Santa Elena. But, you know, that's more of a conversation we should be having over a good glass of Czech beer, which sadly uh, we're not going to have uh, together. What else do we do? So, you know, taxes, which are exempted from the Energy Charter Treaty, are a great tool for states to regulate conduct. Um, if you regulate, try to bear in mind that, you know, energy projects old and new need security and try to balance it. Also, when you pass the law, make sure that when you pass it in the deliberations, you put up all your arguments, your good arguments, why you're doing something. Because if you don't, um, you know, things can happen. Also, it's a good sign of good regulatory practices because it reminds the people who are passing the law what they're aiming to achieve, which reduces the chance of having a dispute over it. But lastly, let me turn to a new risk. The climate change litigations in the US have mostly failed, but there's an outlier decision in the Netherlands where Shell was uh, obliged to change basically their business model within a humongously short time, and that's currently under appeal. There are four cases in Germany pending, no, five actually, four against car companies, one against an energy company, where, the energy, uh, where an NGO is trying to use private individuals as fronting the claims to force these uh, companies to change their business models or you could even say force them out of business. Now, that is an area of risk for a state that a state can almost, it's almost impossible to control because you don't know what your courts are doing. Um, however, it bears bearing in mind that at least internationally, a state is also is directly responsible for the conduct of courts and good regulatory conduct that preempts and um, you know, unilateral actions by courts, um, seems this is the topic for the conference today, um, make sure that they're not trying to act as quasi uh, legislators, because uh, not only is that not the role of courts, it's also uh, slightly dangerous. And with that, and at five minutes, 25 seconds, I pause. So I want to continue drilling down into the details, and we'll turn to Erica soon to discuss the issue of treaty interpretation in existing cases or previous cases involving environmental issues. But while we are discussing some 
practical tips for states. Patrick, I know this was something that you wanted to speak on. Do you have suggestions for government officials that may be dealing with these issues and trying to avoid disputes? Sure, and happy to do that that now. And, and uh, good afternoon, and good evening, and good morning to everyone. Um, one thing that, that we found effective at the, the State Department in preempting disputes or, or being ready for them on the environmental side, and, and a lot of the cases that have been brought against the United States um, under the NAFTA have in some ways been adjacent to, or in, 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 in a couple instances related uh, to an actual environmental measure. So for us, it was very important to establish a strong dialogue with the environmental regulators in the United States, both at the federal and at the state level. And one way that, that we, we did that, um, and, and I encourage um, other states to, to think about whether this works for, for them, is create a, a, a point person, someone who is in the environmental ministry, um, who is empowered formally or informally to be the ISDS point person, the, the person who is in charge of ISDS coordination or, or some title uh, within their organization. And then you, as a, the defense lawyer for, for the government, it's incumbent upon you, it's important for you to ensure that that person, whomever it is, has up-to-date information on the progress the, of how the law is changing, what the obligations are, what the treaty uh, language that, that Eric is going to talk to us about, how it's interpreted and how it's going, and just create that dialogue, take them to drinks, um, keep them involved. And, and then what that person will be empowered to do is be your eyes, right? Because you're defense counsel, you're waiting for the next case. They'll be your eyes in the ministry to give you a heads up when uh, an investment might be impacted by a future, uh, a future environmental regulation. And it just creates a really good dialogue. And then if a dispute arises, you have your person in that ministry who can help explain what's going on, get your message out. And, and we found that very effective. And we, we did that in multiple different agencies uh, and we had a listserv and we had drinks and all of that and it, it really did give us insight into disputes before they arose um, and it allowed us to do things like provide good rationale as to why this is a legitimate environmental regulation um, all of those kinds of narratives that will fit really well within the treaty so in some ways what you're doing is you're creating a, a, a puzzle piece to exactly fit the empty puzzle uh, hole uh, for that you carved out in the treaty, right? So you're, you're doing the work in creating the evidence before the dispute arises. And then if a dispute arises, you're in a much better place to defend yourself. But all of that is, is about communication within your environmental ministry. So I encourage that. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Patrick. So Erica, now over to you. As you are thinking about crafting this narrative, as Patrick says, you are fitting it to something. What are the tools that exist in some of the older generations of treaties that states may wish to consider as they are preparing their defenses in environmental cases? Um, sure, Mallory, happy to talk about that. And um, I would also on, on my part like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to speak this year. Um, well, I, I think um, that the, the place where we need to, to start is actually where both Annette and uh, Sabina left off. Um, I think that we can all agree that um, environmental protection has grown in importance and relevance. Um, but unfortunately, there are many bilateral investment treaties um, that do not, and many treaties in general, um, that don't contain any express provisions relating to environmental protection. Uh, and so what I wanted to talk a little bit about, and this is talking about older generations of treaties, is how um, when states are faced with claims that are brought forward on bilateral tre investment treaties or other kinds of treaties that don't have any express provisions relating to environmental protection, 
how the state can actually bring forward a defense uh, with respect to um, measures that they've taken to protect the environment. Um, one thing I'm not going to elaborate on too much is the question of good regulatory practice um, and the scope of the right to regulate. I think that um, I wanted to keep my my um, my my presentation much much narrower. Um, and indeed, as you alluded to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the question of treaty interpretation. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because, as you can imagine, if a treaty doesn't have any provisions that are expressly addressing questions of the environment, it could create uncertainty as to whether the arbitrators will actually properly consider environmental issues or, in fact, environmental law in general in the event that the state raises um, this as part of its defense. And so here, this is where I'd like to pick off on one of the cases that Sabina mentioned, which was the Santa Elena versus Costa Rica arbitration. Um, there are several particularities to that case, as uh, Sabina alluded to, uh, and the not, not the least of which is the fact that the arbitration um, was actually um, not brought before ICSID under a treaty. It was actually the parties had agreed that there had been an expropriation. The parties agreed that a tribunal, an ICSID tribunal would determine the amount of compensation due for an expropriation. But I think it's an interesting place to start because of the following statement that was made in dicta by the tribunal. The tribunal said, while an expropriation or taking for environmental reasons may be classified as a taking for public purpose, and thus may be legitimate, a taking for this reason does not affect either the nature or the measure of the compensation to be paid. And here's the key line. The international source of the obligation to protect the environment makes no difference. And so here, what I'm getting at is that the Santa Elena Tribunal, not having some sort of a, a treaty provision in front of it, um, where it was forced to consider consider the, the environment, what they kind of came forward with was a hierarchy. They basically were saying investment law is going to trump environmental law, although it acknowledged that both were an international obligations that were out there for the state. And so in light of this, there are and there is an argument to be made that states might want to include language in their investment treaties to account for environmental protection. And this is something that Patrick will talk to you about in a bit. Um, but I wanted to return to the Santa Elena situation um, where the tribunal basically, as I said, considered that there were two norms and automatically said that investment protection is going to prevail over international norms dealing with environmental protection. Um, but is that right? Or maybe the question is as rather, can such decisions be avoided? Um, and indeed, I think the way to avoid such decisions is by pleading the case, your case before tribunals, using the canons of treaty interpretation to establish that environmental law must be taken into account by the investment tribunal, even when deciding under investment treaties that don't contain environmental protection. Um, I think that there are two ways for us to look at this. First, I think there are certain limited circumstances um, where environmental law could in fact trump investment law. Um, and they're very specific, but I'll, I'll just bring them up briefly for consideration. One would be in a context where the same state parties to an investment treaty are also parties to an environmental treaty. Um, and then the question would be what treaty has priority over the other. Um, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which codifies the practice of inter treaty interpretation, actually gives us rules to resolve a normative conflict like this. And Article 30 of the Vienna Convention tells us that if each treaty contains norms on the same subject matter, but the environmental treaty was concluded later, then the environmental treaty should prevail and the investment treaty should be applied only to the extent compatible with the subsequent treaty. Um, Although this is sort of a clear rule, I do acknowledge that its application by investment tribunals will likely be difficult, um, in particular to convince arbitrators that an investment treaty and an environmental treaty might cover the same subject matter. But nevertheless, it's out there. Um, another possible scenario where an environmental norm could replace or trump an obligation under investment treaty would be if and when the environmental obligation would be considered a peremptory norm of international law a fundamental principle of international law from which no derogation would be permitted. 
Um, and in that sort of a case, it wouldn't matter whether either of the states would be party to a particular treaty, the norm, the peremptory norm would, would prevail. Um, now here too, there is a difficulty which I would need to flag, uh, which is that aside from um, things like massive pollution of the air or the sea, most environmental norms are not yet um, considered peremptory. Um, they've rather been developed through principles or standards in multilateral agreements, some customary international law, but as a peremptory norm, it doesn't yet quite um, exist or reach that level. So um, even though there's possibilities out there for environmental law to trump an investment treaty, as you can see, it's, it's a tight, it's a tight path and it would be kind of difficult. But uh, what there is the possibility for is for environmental law and investment law to apply together. Um, and the mechanism by which that can happen, also going back to treaty interpretation, would be Article 31.1 of the convention. If we look there, it sets forth a general rule of interpretation calls for a treaty to be interpreted in good faith, in accordance with its terms, in their context, and in light of the treaty's object and purpose. And then Article 31.3c of the Vienna Convention then specifies that together with context, any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties shall be taken into account. And here, this provision puts a systemic approach to treaty interpretation into place, that whatever their subject matter, um, treaties are a creation of one international legal order from which conclusions must be, must be drawn. And this canon of treaty interpretation is meant specifically to fight against the fragmentation of international law between different subsets, between saying that there's an investment law subset and an environmental law subset. So here we're looking at a systemic interpretation which can then bring the interpretation of a treaty um, to, together in light of these different, um, these different areas. So this means that an investment treaty can be interpreted, interpreted in light of the terms of another treaty, customary international law, general principles, elements that um, speak to environmental, environmental, environmental law in the subject we're talking about. Um, and this makes sense uh, because the ICJ found a long time ago that international law has a strong presumption against normative conflicts because states do not seek inconsistency between rules. And this presumption of harmony between norms has found its way into ICJ case law dealing specifically with environmental matters. Um, so in the Gabichkovo Nagimaro's case, the Iron Rhine case, the Indus Waters case, the e ICJ held in each of those that environmental norms that evolved after a particular state agreement had been put in place, those environmental norms were relevant for the subsequent implementation of the treaties at issue. And in the investment treaty context, there have also been examples where this, um, looking at international law as a whole, um, through the mechanism of Article 31 3C of the Vienna Convention has been used. I can refer to Myers versus Canada, which is a NAFTA matter. Um, and NAFTA is a little bit particular because there is some language about the environment in there. But there, the tribunal did look outside of, of NAFTA, looked to other um, treaties to determine the scope of Canada's power to regulate the cross-border movement of toxic waste, and then ultimately to, to find that Canada's regulatory measures were in breach of its obligations. Um, and here, what I would say is, is that there are even suggestions um, that investment tribunals, suggestions in, in the literature and doctrine, that when investment tribunals are faced with environmental norms, an investment agreement should be assumed to be consistent with subsequent environmental norms, and that those environmental norms should apply unless their application would undermine the object and purpose of an agreement, an investment agreement. And so the result of this would be that an investor actually who opposes the application of an environmental norm would need to justify the norm's non-application instead of a state having to justify its application in the first place. Um, so my sense is that what I've just mentioned right now probably goes a bit farther than what investment tri tribunals are willing to do um, or what we've seen them do. For example, in Myers versus Canada, the, the tribunal looked to some other 
um, some other uh, elements of, of international law, but was actually quite conservative in the way it framed its decision. I don't know if we're, there's a, a shifting that uh, tribunals are ready to take to, to carry out, but who knows, that might change over time. Um, and regardless, there's no question that international investment tribunals are regularly called upon to interpret treaties, apply to the Vienna Convention. And so there's no reason why tribunals um, judging cases under sort of the older generation of treaties could not consider environmental law alongside investment law um, in order to reach their decisions. So I was a bit uh, I was a bit longer um, on my on my bit than some of the others, but I, I wanted to be able to sort of pull forward the this full scope of the issues. Back to you, Mallory. Thanks, Erica. One follow up question for you, actually. Are there particular terms in treaties that you could apply this interpretive framework to? You know, would it come up under a question of what fairness means in the term fair and equitable treatment or non-arbitrariness or police powers? Are there other options? Are those relevant options? I think that I think that those are probably all relevant options. And it probably if I were faced with a specific case, I would be able to figure out some more. I mean, obviously, police powers is a very pertinent one. And that also does go to speak a little bit to the, the regulatory, uh, the right to regulate that I mentioned before, which I, I didn't want to delve into too much. Um, because that's a whole nother uh, area which we could spend a lot of time on. But indeed, I think that um, there's scope um, in, in treaty interpretation to be able to, to, to hook onto, onto different um, terms and different substantive standards of the treaty in order to be able to bring environmental law into uh, to the forefront. Well, and as you mentioned, there, of course, are certain treaties that do mention environmental protection, environmental law, Patrick, let's turn the floor over to you to discuss you know, where those treaties are today and where they may be evolving in the future. Sure, thank you. And, and so let's, let's get some text on the table. Um, and I think that one of the things that was really um, interesting in, in the very, very substantive intervention of Erica was just how difficult it is in many ways to harmonize environmental regulate, regulation in the abstract with very broad investment obligations in a treaty. And there has been, even since the infancy of the field, an understanding that those two ideas can, in certain instances, be in tension with one another. So this is really a story of what is both said expressly in treaties and what is unsaid. And over the last 25 years, it has really taken um, almost a 180 degree turn from where we started to where we where we are now in some of the more recent uh, investment treaty in, uh, instruments. So I thought it might be ideal. I know it's not great to have a PowerPoint on these things, but I want text on the table and then we can kind of deconstruct it a little bit. So if we could just go to the first slide. I, I, I think that it's, it's important, like, Remember this treaty called the NAFTA? Um, I, I remember it. And it was one of the first multilateral treaties between three um, significant economies uh, that dealt with investment. And one of the things that was uh, more of an innovation in the NAFTA is this language, because there was a concern among the, the treaty parties that um, environmental regulations would be thrown aside uh, in an effort to gather up foreign direct investment. So you can see already that we're going to 180 degree difference in, in how states look at these treaties today than perhaps they looked at it in the NAFTA. But the concern there was, look, we're going to get rid of all of our environmental regulations and that's going to be bad. Um, now, <laughs> now it's about protecting our ab ability to, to uh, regulate in the environment. But here's how they dealt with it in the NAFTA. They said, nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prevent a party from adopting or maintaining or enforcing any measure otherwise consistent with this chapter that it considers, which is self-judging language, appropriate to ensure that investment activity in the territory is undertaken in a manner sensitive to environmental concerns. So already what you see here is basically an affirmation that environmental regulations are an important component of what a state does and that the investment chapter 
is meant to be complementary and in some ways sit atop that state function as a discipline, right? So you'll see this language otherwise consistent with this chapter, which means at the end of the day, if you're going to pass an environmental regulation, it needs to be consistent with the fair and equitable treatment minimum standard obligations. It needs to be consistent with expropriation, whatever that means, and consistent with national treatment. So it's basically an environmental regulation needs to be consistent with this chapter and all of the substantive obligations that, that we all know. And then interestingly, from a kind of Article 31.1 analysis, if you look at the, the further elaboration of what the parties were doing here, it, it, it states it's inappropriate to encourage investment by relaxing domestic health, safety, or environmental measures. Now, now that seems a, a little bit shocking perhaps to us now sitting in 2021, but the concern again was that the NAFTA parties would be slashing um, their environmental regulations in order to encourage investment. And this was an exhortation of the NAFTA parties to one another that that is inappropriate. Okay, so, so keep in mind what this word inappropriate is, and we'll see how it lives in further elaborations because it turns it right on its head. So if we go to the next slide, these are just kind of more modern versions of what I would say is uh, NAFTA language or, or kind of um, the, 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 so if you look here, you have, again, the, the Mexico, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement includes similar language as the NAFTA did, otherwise consistent with this chapter. And it also now uses a different formulation, um, which elaborates on indirect expropriation, right? And this is building off of a history of environmental regulations being found to be an indirect expropriation. So this is an elaboration for purposes of an Article 31 analysis under the Vienna Convention. It says non-discriminatory regulatory actions by a party. This is in little, little b to the right there. Uh, applied to project legitimate public welfare objectives, such as health, safety, and environment, do not constitute indirect expropriations, except in rare circumstances, right? So you have a lot to work with there as a litigator um, and as a defense attorney, thinking about what legitimate means, whether this is a rare circumstance, and there's a lot of case law about that, which we don't need to go into here, but that's how this kind of treatment exists still in uh, big multilateral treaties like the USMCA or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? It's the same language in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So let's bracket that and now move to something a little bit new, right? So if you go to the next slide, um, here we have the CETA, right? The Canadian European Agreement, and which I'm sure many in the audience are incredibly familiar with. But here, there is no concept, there is no statement that these obligations, a, a environmental measure, needs to be otherwise consistent with the investment chapter. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be, it's just unsaid. And what is said and unsaid in a treaty, obviously, is, is very important for the, the Vienna Convention analyses that, that Erica has put forward, the kind of framework on interpretive framework, how to give flexibility to tribunals to navigate these tensions, right? So all we have in CETA is language similar to what we had um, reaffirming the right to regulate, to achieve legitimate policy objectives such as public health, safety, and environment, right? And then the language for greater certainty on um, indirect expropriation, but they broaden it away from indirect expropriation into all of the obligations under this section. So we've moved from otherwise consistent with this chapter to something that's, that's far broader and, a, and basically a move away from the disciplines, right? So just to read this, it says for greater certainty, which is code as you treaty drafters in the audience know to retroactively try to apply everything. For greater certainty, the mere fact that a party regulates, including through modification of its laws in a matter which negatively affects its investment, interferes with investors' expectations, include blah, 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 does not amount to a breach of an obligation under this section. In other words, if you are passing an environmental reg, 
it doesn't necessarily amount to a breach of an obligation under this section. So you start to see a, a, a move away from um, disciplining environmental regulations um, with the same scrutiny that you have in the TPP and the, the NAFTA. So if you move to the next slide, here we have some new standards, right? And this is taking uh, language from the Netherlands model BIT, uh, the new Netherlands model BIT. Here, it, it, the, the word appropriate comes back, but it's not, it's inappropriate for a state to slash its environmental laws. It says it's inappropriate to lower the levels of protections. We recognize it's inappropriate to lower the levels of protections afforded by domestic environmental or labor law to encourage investment, right? So there you're giving a gloss, and I'll stop soon. There you're giving a gloss on kind of how this treaty should be interpreted. And then it says, except in rare circumstances, that language, measures that are so severe, so severe in light of their purpose that they appear to manifestly, excessively, non-discriminatory measures that are designed and applied in good faith protect, those do not constitute indirect expropriation. So really it's, it's giving a gloss, it's giving a, an interpretation on how high the standard needs to be. And this is obviously untested language, but this is consistent with some of the new treaties. So if you move to the next slide, which is my last slide, is these new carve-outs. Israel, UAE, the most, one of the most recent BITs, has um, a, a pretty significant carve-out. Um, it says, subject to the requirements that measures are not applied in an arbitrary or unjustifiable manner and do not constitute disguised restrictions on international trade and investment, nothing in this agreement, nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent a party from adopting or maintaining. So basically there it's saying, tribunal, you are able to look at a human and animal or health or environmental measure only on questions of whether it's arbitrary or unjustifiable and is a disguised restriction on investment. So I think what you're, and then the same kind of except in rare circumstances, severity and things. So what I think, and then I'll stop, you're likely going to see in the future is a lot of this language being tested as disputes normally arise, but a real focus of tribunals on whether their, the, the environmental measure is disguised, is a disguised environmental measure meant to do something else. It's, it's so meant to um, restrict trade or penalize or be unjustifiable. Um, and that disguised language is cropping up a lot. So one thing you can do to protect yourself ex ante is not only draft treaties properly um, with precision the way that you want them, balancing what you need to balance, but also explain why a regulation is important um, as applied and not a disguised measure. And I think that would be very helpful for you to avoid uh, that kind of scrutiny from an investor um, if, if they are impacted by the regulation that you pass. Let me stop there. Thanks, Mallory. Thanks, Patrick. We are going to open up the floor soon to questions. And while we're waiting for those to come in, I wanted to go back to uh, Annette and Sabina. Tell us about your predictions for the future. Do you uh, agree with what Patrick has laid out? Are there other considerations that we should be bearing in mind? I can I can jump in first, and I, I think we have potentially two meta trends. If one listened to what we had discussed here, I think um, one, of course, uh, relates to what Patrick talked about and sort of the new treaty drafting, and and also to some extent what Erica talked about, how we how we create that necessary space for governments to act to protect the environment or to take action for the for the public health including for example cl climate change actions so sort of enabling the government to act and not without the risk of, of facing a claim so that's one but the, the other one being then where and this is what sabina alluded to where there is there's some risk involved for governments and that's not that's when governments are not doing enough so it's one that you, you, are, you are being able to do what you, what you want to do, but the other where you are pushing the government to do more. And I think probably we will see uh, more of that because that's the fact that not enough action is being seen uh, when it comes to, um, to, to this issue. So that's two meta trends, I think. Uh, and just briefly, on, we talked about it before, um, uh, I think, Erica, if I ever have a, a situation where I need someone to really uh, 
be on my side and argue environmental issue under no treaty, I will call you, right? <laughs> it's a deal. <laughs> but when we talked about the carving out the, the boundaries for the for the um, uh, for the for the for the standards and the treaties, I think there's this one case, the Allard versus Barbados. If I'm not miscorrect in that case, there there were discussions by the tribe carving out the standards of full protection and security, because here the investor had argued that the mere fact that, uh, according to the investor, the state had breached their obligations under another international treaty, uh, an international environmental treaty, that should be brought into interpretation whether or not that constituted a breach of full protection and security. In this case, the investor in the end lost the case, but there was there's a language in the reasoning of the tribunal that really seems to open a door to the fact that, yes, that could be a relevant factor when you do carve out the, to the boundaries of the standards. So I think that's, in, that's something to look uh, at as well when we're, when we're trying to understand how the old treaties can be argued in parallel with inter other international agreements. So that's my two cents. So um, let's put us back New Year's Eve 2019 sounds like a very, very, very distant past where we all went skiing uh, or to the Maldives or something. If we had this conference then or another conference or asked around, you know, what's the biggest threat to humanity? Then um, many people, especially younger people, would have said climate change, environmental. Now, fast forward just three months, March 2020 beginning of COVID. In terms of our priorities, uh, climate change has now a rival, uh, the coronavirus and all of its um, you know, variants uh, going through the Greek alphabet. And I predict by the end of the year, we uh, next year we'll probably uh, in the double digit uh, Greek letters in terms of variants. New Year's Eve 2019, nobody would have anticipated that. Now, same may happen in two years and five years and six years. I am, and, and people know that, I'm not a big fan of drafting ad hoc treaties. I like treaties that can remain unchanged for 50, for 70 years. And our traditional FET and full security and protection standards actually haven't much changed in the wording since 1794. Actually, that is a German uh, invention I'm quite proud of because in the common law for the Prussian lands, um, from the transition of an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy, those rights were implemented. And by the way, against your own state, not just for foreigners. And I would like to, to continue on my devil's advocate argument. And uh, if Martin could up, put back up the uh, Israeli um, UAE treaty again from Patrick's. Um, as a German, maybe this is a risk that you mainly see if you're German. Um, Germany has pretty strong rules against kosher slaughtering processes, which uh, our courts consider, at least when it comes to halal, to a violation of you know, rules against animal cruelty. If such a treaty existed and, you know, uh, between Israel and Germany, Germany would be allowed to prohibit both the production in Germany and the importation of such meat um, that is slaughtered in uh, a kosher compliant way. So such a treaty would allow to cut off the Jewish population in Germany from meat, uh, for them to be all vegetarians. By the way, this is a vegetarian speaking. Um, I don't think that the drafters of such a treaty would have thought of such a side effect. And this may be not so far-fetched uh, example because there's case law in the German courts on the topic. I have an uneasy feeling with that. I, I quite, quite honestly, when Erika mentioned, uh, you know, maybe we should um, do away with the traditional compulsory compensation for expropriation in bi environmental um, cases. And Santa Elena was a case of a direct expropriation. Um, is there really a peremptory norm against the payment of compensation? I posit not. 
And Costa Rica at that time um, had the very and now has the very laudable aim of having three percent of its uh, of its territory devoted to national parks. At the time of the Unglaube cases, what was in the national budget for all started but not concluded expropriation, it's, it would have taken 120 years to pay off the expropriated parties. I am torn. The environment is important. Avoiding climate change is important. Uh, protecting public health is important. But so are the rights of the individual. And we need to make sure that we keep the balance and we keep the powers of tribunals to enforce a balance. Because all well-meaning um, regulation, there may be mistakes. And of course, the states are, that are, uh, whose representatives are present in the, in, in the meeting would never do that. But you know, living in Germany not so long ago in, in terms of, uh, you know, the history of the world, this was a country where regulation was used against its own people and against foreigners. Um, and I don't know if I could make the same prediction for the next 70 years for my home state or any state in the world that it couldn't go back. So um, with that kind of preachy, uh, preachy statement, I'm a fan of old treaties. And if a standard has worked and has not curtailed um, regulatory freedom of states for 200 years, there is some sort of likelihood it's not going to be burdensome in the next 20 years. But that's maybe just me. So I, I want to give Erica a chance to respond if she wants it. And I also have one question that may be more of a, a thinking question to leave everyone with, but I will follow up with that after Erica. Thanks. No, I, I don't think that there is a peremptory norm uh, that says that compensation for expropriation shouldn't happen. Um, in fact, what I did say was is that at least with respect to environmental matters, there most environmental matters haven't reached the level of a peremptory norm yet. Um, and so it's not something that will at all costs trump anything in an investment treaty. What I would say, though, is that there are other investment cases that are out there, and I'm very bad with case names, so I do apologize. Um, it was some of the NAFTA cases that were dealing with environmental issues that actually examined the uh, manner in which the state dealt with environmental issues to determine that, not that the expropriation was lawful, but rather that the expropriation didn't even happen to the under under the meaning within the meaning of the treaty. That is to say that the way that the tri the the state had dealt with the environmental considerations, even though the investor had pleaded that it amounted to an expropriation, the tribunal said no. There was no expropriation to be considered under the treaty at all. So that is one thing that I would say, maybe Patrick remembers the names of the cases. I, I, I'm very bad at them, I'm afraid. But the holding was that. So I do think that we need to, to understand that they're in connection with the right to regulate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that this does have an impact on the liability or lack thereof of the states to begin with. So that would be, I guess, my one thing I wanted to mention. So the question that I had came from something that Annette said and that Sabina followed up on. And what occurred to me as I was listening to Annette speak about potentially not doing enough is that both an act and an omission by a state can give rise to international liability. And as Sabina said, there has to be this balance between situations where a state needs to do something, it cannot omit to act, but it also cannot take an action that contravenes some international norm. So with the few minutes that we have left, do you have any suggestions for states as they try to navigate these situations in the future? Maybe two. The old Kantian um, principle, uh, act, always act, so what you're going to do will comply with it, with general regulation, which basically is what we're covering in FET anyway. But also um, have, the, have tribunals as a stopgap. Lay out your arguments before you and, and think of how you want to present your arguments if you have to justify yourself. And that's a good trick also when you make your own decisions. Lay out your grounds. Make them transparent. 
discuss them and weigh them, and then think what would an independent third party say to your arguments. And that might actually be a good guideline both for legislators and for individual life. But the last one, and to keep that balance, sometimes we're blind by our own actions and you know this need is so pressing we need to do something um having somebody to tell us hey stop this may not have been your best idea uh i know there's a crisis but you put the baby literally out with the bath um a strong judiciary inside the country that has a quicker and faster way of resolving it maybe you one of your best arguments against finding yourselves in an arbitration, provided there's no fork in the road, because in that case, you may not have access to courts, um, but people will go to arbitration straight away. So I know that some of our panelists have a hard stop right now. We could speak about all of these topics for hours, but because it's 7 p.m. where many of you are, or even later or earlier in the morning, let us pause here and I just want to thank all of the panelists for their fascinating remarks and again thank the conference organizers for having us. Thank Thanks you. Very much. Yep. Thank you very much, Mallory, uh, for uh, your uh, panel. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Scheuer one more time, as well as all the speakers and all the participants for joining our annual conference. We hope that next year in the early fall, we'll be able to welcome you to Prague in person again. Stay well and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you.